Welcome to John Lennon, the Rolling Stone interview podcast. This is the first of what will be a weekly series of installments of the full historic interview. The interview was conducted by founding editor and publisher Jan S. Wenner in December of 1970. A brief word about the audio you're about to hear. While John was mic'd, our interviewer was not. For that reason, we've had to boost the audio so that you can hear Jan's questions and exchanges with Lennon. So you will notice a difference in the sound from time to time. Nothing has been removed. Here now is part one of John Lennon, the Rolling Stone interview podcast. Oh, you got notes and all that. Yeah. Well, we have to get it right, don't we? Um, gives a bit of paper to doodle on. Or is it all notes? Okay. Now, when you get through the first one, I'll have it. Thank you. Okay. Don't be shy. No, I'm not. Um. But let's talk about something. What are, you, are you pleased with your album, the new album? Yes. I mean, like, uh, I'm very pleased, you know. And there's, there's lots of things I would have liked to improve, you know. Like what? Well, I learned a lot on this album, you know, technically. That I didn't have to learn so much before. Because it was usually, uh, I don't know. There'd be, say, George Paul, and I would all all be look, listening to it, and uh, I wouldn't have to think so much about each individual sound. So there's a few things I learned about bass, you know, on one track or the other, where you can get more in and where I lost it on a track like that. Some technical things that irritated me finally, but as a concept and as a a whole thing, I'm pleased, yeah. Um, That's about it, really. You know what I mean? I mean? If I get down to the nitty-gritty... It, it, you know, it would drive me mad, you know. But I like it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put it out. When you record, you go for feeling or for uh, perfection of the sound? Uh, well, I, I like both, you know. I go for feeling. Mo- most takes are, are right off. And uh, most times, I sang it and played it at the same time, you know. I can't stand uh, putting the back in, which is what we used to do a lot in the old days. But they're always dead, you know. I got into that sort of dead Beatles sound or dead recording sound. So I like to, some of them like second take or something right off, you know. It starts out with uh, bells. Yeah. Why? Uh, well, I was watching uh, TV as usual in in California, and there was this old horror movie on, and I just heard that bells sounded like that to me. Well, they're probably different because those were actually other bells slowed down that I used on the album. But it just sounded like that, and I just thought, oh, that's how to start Mother, you know. And I knew Mother was going to be the first track, so... You said you wrote most of them in California? Well, a lot of it. Actually, I wrote Mother in England, didn't I? And uh, Isolation in England. It just seems though it was already... I finished them off in California. Um, I mean, you can go into detail. If you, you have to push me if you want more yeah, detail, because otherwise I'll just Look forget. Yeah. Look at Me was written uh, around the Beatles' double album time. You know, I just never got it got it done, you know. There's a few like that lying around. Um, you said that this, you know, that this would be the first primal album. When did I say that? In California. <laughs> yeah, so I don't Have you know. gone off that? No, no, I haven't gone off. It's just like, uh, primal was like another mirror, you know, and uh, I just, just... See, because he sort of, uh, he sort of, like any artist, I suppose, but because he really wants to sort of be honest with himself in the albums and all that, you know, what he does is, instead of just patching up something that's sort of interesting, so-so or something, he really puts himself in, his life in it, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, like when he went to uh, India and he was influenced by Maharishi and so forth. It's really like, uh, you know, like writers take themselves to Singapore to get the atmosphere. So wherever I am, you know. So in that way, it's a primal album. But it's like, uh, is George's the first Gita album? Right. You know. So it's 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 that relevant. The, the primal screen okay, is like right. a mirror, you know. And he was looking at the well, mirror. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Nick Jano for yeah. a second. Um, 
Yeah. When you came out to San Francisco, you, you know, you had that, you wanted to do that ad. Yeah. You want to say, this is it. Well, I think that's something people go through at the beginning of that therapy, you know, because you're so astounded at what you find out about yourself that uh, you think, well, surely somebody, nobody's heard, you know, surely this is something, because it happens to you, you think, well, this is, must be the first time it's happened, you know. So it's just full of it like that. Okay. Okay. You know, so it was just like, uh, and also it was like we, were, we wanted to come out so that I like the need to have a, re a reason for going somewhere, otherwise I'm too nervous. Mm -hmm. So I con myself, you know. And that was a good way of coming to San Francisco to see you, in a way, you know. And, I, and then I have an objective, I'm going to do an advert. And this is what we're going to do. So we come in the office, we're going to do this and all that, and then we sit, settle down, we just talk, you know. So it's really like that. But, um, but I still think, uh, I still be, think the therapy is great, you know, but I just don't want to make it into a big uh, Maharishi thing. That, like, you, right. you, you were right to tell me to forget the advert. And that's why I don't even want to talk too much about it. Mm. If people know what I've, what I've been through there, and if they want to find out, they can find out, you know. Otherwise, it turns into yeah. that so again, you know. I no. feel that this, this is the single thing to do, just uh, a number of therapies. I don't know, you see, because I have no idea about any other therapy. You know, I don't think any, anything else would work on me uh, so well. But then, of course, I don't, I'm not through with it, you know. It's a, it's a process that's going on. We primal almost daily mm -hmm. and the only difference the thing that the see I don't really want to get this big primal thing going because it gets so embarrassing you know and the thing lit in a nutshell a primal therapy allowed us to feel feelings continually and those feelings usually make you cry that's all so because before I wasn't feeling things that's all I was having blocks to the feelings. When the feelings come through, you cry. It's as simple as that, really. Do you think the uh, well, experience of therapy uh, helped you become a better singer? Oh, no. Do you think your singing is, uh, is better on this album? Uh, well, it's probably better because I've got the whole time to myself, you know. I mean, I'm pretty good at home with my tapes. <laughs> you know, like, it's like that. But this time, it was my album, and uh, I, was, I didn't have to... It's a, some, it used to get a bit embarrassing in front of George and Paul because we know each other so well. Oh, look, he's trying to be Elvis, oh, he's doing this now, you know. We were a bit super critical of each other, so we inhibited each other a lot. And now I had Yoko there and Phil there, uh, alternatively and together, who sort of love me, okay, so I can perform better. And I relaxed, you know. I've got a studio at home now, and I think it'll be better next time because that's even less inhibiting than going to EMI, you know. It's like that. Uh, but the the looseness of the singing was was developing on cold turkey from the experience of Yoko's singing. See, she 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 doesn't does not inhibit her throat. It says on the album that uh, that Yoko does wind. Yeah, well, she played wind. You know, I mean, she played the atmosphere. But uh, the f uh, no, she wasn't around. She did. It. She. Pre she has a, a music ear and she can produce rock and roll. She can produce me, you know, which she did for some of the tracks. I'm not going to start saying it, she did this and he did that. But for, when Phil couldn't come at first, you know, you don't have to be, have been born and bred in rock. She knows when a bass sounds right and when the guy's playing out of rhythm and when the engineer, she has a bit of trouble. The engineer thinks, well, who the hell is this? You know, what does she know about it? So she did that for me, you know. I'm, I'm working class hero, it sounds like a, like an early Dylan song. Well, anybody that sings with a guitar and, and just sings about something heavy will tend to sound like Dylan. I'm bound to be influenced by those, because that's the only kind of really folk music I ever listened to. I never liked the fruity Colin, Judy Collins and Byers and all that stuff, you know. I, I, so the only folk music I know is those doing the minor dungaree, you know, that sort of yeah. about miners up in Newcastle or Dylan. So in that way, I'd be influenced, you know. But it doesn't sound like Dylan to me. Um. Does it sound like Dylan to you? Uh, only in the instrumentation now. But that's it, no, but that's yeah. the that's the only way to play. You know, you go jing 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 jing. I mean, I never listened to him that hard to him, you know. Um, what's November 5th?
in England is the, the day they blew up the Houses of Parliament. We celebrate it by having bonfires every November the 5th. I just, it just was an ad lib, you know. We'd been doing, it was about the third take. And I just got to the remember, and it begins to sound like Frankie Lane, you know, when, when, when you sing, remember. And then it was the end, I didn't know how to go, remember. The 5th of November. You know, and I just broke up. And it w went on for about another seven or eight minutes, you know. I was just ad libbing and goofing about. But then I cut it there and just exploded, because it was a good joke, you know. And we, haven't you ever heard of the, uh, Guy Fawkes? Guy Fawkes. That's the Guy Fawkes day, yeah. And I thought it was just poignant that we should blow up the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> um, it's that, do, you, do you get embarrassed sometimes when you hear the album, when, you know, when you think about how personal it is? Uh, I, no, I get embarrassed. Uh, I'm not so much. Some, you see, I have, sometimes I can hear it and be embarrassed just by the performance or by the, the music or by the statements. And sometimes I don't, you know, I, I change daily, you know. Or, like, before it, just before it's coming out, I can't bear to ha hear it, you know, in, in the house or play it to anybody. But a few months before that, I can play it to everyone. And it, it just changes all the time, you see. You, you, like it does, you know, sometimes I used to listen to something, I don't know, Buddy Holly or anything. One minute it sound, one day the record would sound twice as fast as the next day. Did you ever experience that on a single? I used to have that, like, Hound Dog or something. One day it would sound very slow, and one day it would sound very fast. And it was just the mo just my feeling towards it, you know, the way I heard it. So it can do that. But that's where you've got to make your artistic judgment to say, well, this is the take, and this isn't, you know. That's where, where you have to make the decision when it sounds reasonable. What, what, is, what is your concept of pain? Uh, I don't know what you mean, really. Well, on the on the song "God," yes, it, it starts off by saying "God is a concept by which we measure our pain." Well, pain is a pain we go through all the time, you know, and uh, like you're you're born in pain, you know, and pain is what we're in most of the time, you know? and I think that the bigger the pain, the more gods we need, you know. There's a tremendous body of literature, of philosophical literature, about God as, as, as a measurement of pain. Oh, I never heard about it. <laughs> See, it was my own re revelation. See, I don't know who wrote about it or what anybody else said. I just know that's, a, that's what I know. Um, you, um, Amazing. Mm, but you just felt it. Yeah, I felt it, you see. So when I felt it, it's like I was crucified, you know. So I know what they're talking about now. Uh, what's the, what, what is the um, difference between uh, uh, George Martin and uh, Phil Spector? Well, George Martin, uh, uh, I don't know. You see, for for quite quite a few of our albums, like the, Be the Beatles double album, George Martin didn't really produce it, you know. I don't know whether this is slanderous, but he didn't, you know. And uh, I can't remember, stuff. you know. In the early days, I can remember what George Martin did, you know. What did he do? He would translate... Well, I always think, I can't, th I think, well, he did it uh, if Paul wanted to use violins and that. He would translate it for him. Like in, in my life, there's a, a Elizabethan piano solo in it. So he did, would do things like that. He'd say, play like Bach or something. Could you put 12 bars in there? And he, he helped, helped us develop a, a language a little, you know, to talk to musicians. But I was never, a, because I, I'm very shy and many, many reasons, I didn't very much go for musicians, you know. I didn't like to have to go and see 20 guys sitting there and try and tell them what to do, because they were all so lousy anyway, you know. So if, apart from the early days, I didn't have much to do with it, you know. I, I, I did it myself, you know. What, why do you use Phil now instead of George no. Martin? Uh, well, it's not instead of George Martin. I would not use anybody mm -hmm. rather than use... George Martin or something like that. That's nothing personal against George Martin. He just uh, doesn't... He's more Paul's style of music than mine, you know. He, he, uh, but... I don't know. I mean, I used... It's, it's 
a drag to do both, you know. To go in the in in the, the recording studio, it's simple that you go know, in there and then you gotta run back and say, Did you get it, you know? Did Phil make did Phil make any special contact? Phil yes, yes. because uh, Phil's I believe is a great artist. But like all great artists, he's very neurotic, you know. But we'd done quite a few tracks together, Yoko and I. And she'd been encouraging me in the other room and all that. And we were just lagging and Phil moved in and brought in a new life to 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 because we were getting heavy we'd done a few stuff a few things you know and the the thrill of recording had worn off a little went on oh now okay eight minutes we'll put it on that's pete do you know pete that's pete bennett the the great and that's jan one of the great great okay but you tell tell him to ring us in eight minutes so you can sort of Thanks. You can hear what you can hear Spectre here and there, you know. And I can't, it's like there's no specifics. You can just hear hear him. Let, let, let me start again. Yeah. Okay. Are you pleased with the album? Yes. This from the top. Of course, I'm pleased with it. Yeah. What do you think of it? I think it's the best thing I've ever done. I think it's uh, realistic. And it's. It's true to, the, to me that has been developing over the years from in my life, I'm like I'm a loser, help, uh, Strawberry Fields. They were all personal records. I always wrote about them. And didn't really enjoy writing third-person songs about people who lived in concrete hat flats and things. I like first-person music. But because of my hang-ups and many other things, I would only now and then specifically write about me, you know. And now... I wrote all about me, you know, and that's why I like it. It's me, and nobody else. So I like it. You know? So you think, like, basically, the honesty of it is not just it's real, you know. It's about me, and I don't know about anything else really. And the only true songs I ever wrote were like "Help" and "Strawberry Fields," you know. And uh, and if I can name a few, I can't think of them offhand. That that the, the I always considered my best songs. They were the ones that I I really wrote from experience, and not uh, projecting myself into a situation and writing a nice story about it, which I always found phony. But I'd find occasion to do it because I'd have to produce so much work, or because I'd be so hung up I couldn't even think about myself. You know. For instance, on this album, there's like practically no imagery at all. No. Because uh, there's none in my head, you know. There's no hallucinations. There's no newspaper taxis. And... No, I was I was consciously writing poetry then, mm. and that's self-conscious poetry, you know. Mm. But the poetry on this album is superior to anything I've done because it's not self-conscious in that way. I've tried, you know. I had least trouble writing the songs of all time, you know. No bullshit. Yeah, no bullshit, is it? You know. uh, the, the music is very simple and very sparse. Well, I always liked simple rock, you know. There's a great one in England now, I hear you knocking, you know. And the, I liked uh, Spirit in the Sky a few months back. I, think, I always liked simple rock and nothing else, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I was influenced by acid and got psychedelic, you know, like the whole generation. But really, I like rock and roll, you know. And I express myself best in rock. And I had a few ideas to do this with mother and that with mother. But when you just hear the piano does it all for you, your mind can do the rest of it. Uh, I think the backings on mine are as complicated as the backings on any record you've ever heard. You know? If you've got an ear, you can hear anybody, know, any musician will tell you, just play a note on a piano. It's got all them harmonics in it. You know? So it got to that, you know. What, what the hell? I didn't need anything else, you know. How did you... Um uh, put together the litany in God. What's litany? Well, the, the uh, I don't believe in, in magic or Star Uh Well, I, like a lot of the words, they just came out of my mouth. It started off like that, you know. So I was, God was stuck together from three songs almost. I had the, I had the idea God is a concept by which we measure our pain. So when you have a, 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 a word like that, you just sit down and sing the first tune that comes into your head, and, and the tune is the symbol. God is the concept. 
boom, 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 boom. You know, because I like that kind of music. And then, and then I just rolled into it. I don't believe in magic. And it was just going on in my head. And I Ching and Bible, and the first three or four just came out, whatever came out, you know. Did you, and when did you know that you were going to be working towards the to I don't believe in Beatles? Uh, I don't know when I realized I was putting down all, all, all these things that I didn't believe in, you know. So I just, I could have gone on. It was like a Christmas card list, you know. I thought, well, where do I end? You know, Churchill and uh, who have I missed out? It got like that, you know. And I thought, I had to stop, you know. So, you to do it yeah, and then I was going to leave a gap and say, just fill in your own, you know, mm-hmm. for whoever you don't believe in. in. It was just get, got out of hand, you know. So, But Beatles was the final thing because... Uh, it's like I no longer believe in in myth, you know, and Beatles is another myth, you know. I don't believe in it. The the dream's over, you know. And I'm not just talking about the Beatles is over. I'm talking about the generation thing, you know. The dream's over, like it's over, you know. And we gotta, well, I have anyway personally gotta get down to so-called reality. You know? Were you? I, when did you become aware that? Uh, I mean, that song wants to be the. It's the one thing played the most. Well, I didn't know that, because up here they're playing... They're not playing... I don't know. I'll, I'll be able to tell in a week or so, really, what's going on, because they started off playing Look At Me, because it was easy, and I was, they probably thought it was the Beatles or something. You know? So I don't know if that is the one. Well, that's the one. God and Working Glass Hero are probably the, the, the best whatevers, you know, sort of ideas or feelings on the record. Why, do you, why did you choose to refer to Bowen as Zimmerman rather than Bowen? Because uh, Dylan is bullshit. Zimmerman is his name. You know? You see, I don't believe in Dylan, you know. Uh, And I think... I don't believe in Tom Jones either, you know. In that way. You know, Zimmerman is his name. My name isn't John Beetle, it's John Lennon. You know, Just like that. Why did you tag Mummy's bed on that? Because... that's what's happened, you know. <laughs> it, all these songs just came out of me, you know. I didn't sit down to think I'm going to write about my mother, or I didn't sit down to think I'm going to write about this, that, or the other. They all came out, you know, like all the best work of anybody's ever does, you know, whether it's an article or a, you know, it's just the best ones come out, and all these came out because I had, I had the time, and I was... When, when you do, st- if you're on holiday or in therapy or wherever you are, if you spend time, like in India, I wrote the, the last batch of best songs, you know, where I could write a lot like I'm So Tired and Year Blues, where they were pretty sort of realistic, you know, they were about me, and it always struck me as, uh, fu- not what's the word, funny, ironic or something, that I was writing in supposedly in, with the, in the presence of, guru and meditating so many hours a day I was writing I'm so tired and and uh, you know songs of such pain as your blues which I meant it wasn't just me right you know I was trying to express it in the blues idiom because cold turkey cold turkey but that was that was I was writing Maharishi's camp writing I, I want to die you know um your blues was that was that also deliberately meant to be a parody of the uh uh, English blues? Yeah, well, a bit, because I'm a bit... We're always self-conscious, and Beatles super self-conscious people, about uh, parodying Americans, which we do and have done. I know we developed our own style, but we still, in a way, parody American music. And... Uh, oh, and... See, like... This is interesting, because in the early days, in, in England, all the groups were like Elvis... And, and a backing group. And the Beatles deliberately didn't move like Elvis. That was our policy because we, we found it stupid and bullshit, you know. And then Mick Jagger came out and resurrected bullshit movement, you know, whittling your arse and that. So then people began to say, well, the Beatles are passe because they don't move. But we did it as an intellectual. When we were younger, we used to move, we used to jump out and do all the things they're doing now, like going on stage with toilet seats and shitting and pissing. That's what we're doing in Hamburg, you know, and smashing things up. It wasn't that 
I think that Pete Townsend sort of worked out. It's something that you do when you play six or seven hours. There's nothing else to do. You smash the place up. You insult everybody, you know. But we, we, grew, we were groomed, you know, and we dropped all that. And the same with uh, whatever it was we started off talking about, you know, <laughs> what, which was what? About singing, what was it? What, what, what was the beginning of that? About you would, was uh, your blues deliberately? Yeah, yeah, so there's a self-consciousness about suddenly singing blues. I mean, we were all listening to uh, Sleepy John Estes and all that in art school, like everybody else, you know. But to sing it was something else, you know. And so I was self-conscious about doing it. So I just, I think Dylan does it a lot, you know. In, in case he's not sure of himself, he makes it double entendre. So it's, therefore you're securing your hipness. But George was saying, don't call or Paul, no, Paul was saying, don't call it your blues, just say it straight, you know. But I was self-conscious and I went for the year blues, you know. Obviously there's some... The, um, but I think all that is past now because I think the musicians have, we've all got over it, you know, that self-consciousness. You know, I think John being John is a bit unfair to his music in a way. Like, uh, so I like to just add a few things, you know, like he can go on for an hour or something, but I mean, one thing is, like uh, about the Art Janoff, you know, Say if John fell in love, you know, he's always falling in love with all sorts of things, you know, Maharaj to what not. Well, Could they tape it and I'll listen to it later? Uh, nobody, nobody knows. There's a point in the, on the first song on, on Yoko's track where the guitar comes in and even Yoko thought it was her voice. Because mm, the session, amazing. we did all the Yoko's in one night. A whole session. It was just fantastic. The whole album? Yeah. Yes, Except the whole for the Ornette, there's a track with Ornette Coleman that that was from the past that we put on to show people that she <coughs> she didn't wasn't discovered by the Beatles and that she's been around a few years. I mean, we've got stuff of her with Cage, Ornette Coleman, everywhere. We put it out. We're going to put oldies but goldies out next for Yoko. Mm -hmm. You know, the stuff with all the. But uh, yeah, I, well, I'll play it and talk about it later. Okay. No, I just think that uh, you know he just goes on falling in love with all sorts of things. But it's like, say, if he fell in love with some girl or something and he wrote a song. Who he, he fell in love is not very important. It's the outcome of it. You know, the song itself is important. Well, there's a lot. For instance, there's, you have to say the song is Well, Well, Well. Yes. It's connected with Final Fantasy. Well, the theory of that song. Why? What? The screaming. No, no, but listen to Cold Turkey. Well, he's screaming already there. Listen to um, Twist and Shout. I couldn't sing the damn thing. I was just screaming. Listen to Wop Wop Loom or Blop Bamboo. Don't get the therapy confused mm. with with the music. No, I was now, screaming. And uh, Yoko's the whole, whole thing was that scream. Listen to Don't Worry Kyoko. It's one of the fucking best rock and roll records ever made. Listen to it and play Tutti Fruity. Listen to Don't Worry Kyoko the other side of, of Cold Turkey. You see, I, you know, I, I'm digressing from my album. If, you can, if somebody fr with a rock-oriented mind can possibly listen to her stuff, you'll see what she's doing. It's, it's fantastic, you know. It's as, it's as important as anything we ever did and as important as anything Stones or Townsend ever did. And it, listen to it, you know, and you'll hear what, what she's putting down. And I, on Cold Turkey, I'm getting towards it. And you, you were know. saying about I was, life I'm influenced by her music. 1,000%, you know, more than ever was by Dylan. And it, it, she, she makes music like you've never heard on earth, you know. And when the musicians play with it, they're inspired out of their skulls. They might go, I don't know how much they play it later. You see them, wait till it, I've got, we've got a cut of hair on, from the Lyceum in London with 30, 15 or 20 musicians playing with her from Bonnie and Delaney and a fucking lot. And we played the tracks the other night. It's the most fantastic music I've ever heard, you know. And they, they've probably gone away and forgotten all about it. We, uh, we're going to put it out. It's fantastic, you know. I was just gonna it's like uh, 20 years a, ahead of its time. Anyway, yes. back to mine. Yes, Cold Turkey, <laughs> when you were... Yeah. You, you, Listen to Turkey. Cold Turkey, you said, you said that's not a song, that's a diary. Yeah, well, so is this. Everything. So is this, you know. And I announced Cold Turkey on the Lyceum saying, well, I'm going to sing a song about yeah, pain. Yes, yes. And that was so before pain was and screaming was before Janoff. I mean, Janov showed, you know, I went through therapy, like I told you, with him, you know. And uh, 
I'm probably looser all over. Are you less paranoid now? No, but I, I, I can feel my own fear. I can feel my own pain. Therefore, I can handle it better than I could before. That's all. I'm the same, only there's a channel. It doesn't just remain in me. It goes round and gives, I can move a little easier. What was your experience with heroin? Heroin? Uh, I, when we, anything on this we'll take out later. Okay. Uh, it just was not too much fun, you know. I never uh, injected it. and uh, We sniffed a little, you know, when we were in real pain. I mean, we just couldn't. People were giving us such a hard time. Yeah. No. But we, we got such a hard time from everyone, you know. And I've had so much shit thrown at me and at Yoko, you know, especially at Yoko. People just... Uh, I had Peter Brown in our office, and you can put this in. After we come back from six months, he comes down and shakes my hand and doesn't even say hello to her. You know. Now, that's going on all the time, you know, and we get in so much pain that we have to, we have to do something about it, you know. And that's what, what happened to us, you know. We, we took H because of what the Beatles and their pals were doing to us. Let's go back and we got that. out of it, you know. You know, like uh, he he was saying about Phil Spector. I mean, they didn't set down to do it, but the pe I, people's things came out at that period, you know. And I don't forget. You know, he really produced his own stuff, you know. Like Phil is, as you know, w well known about very skillful sort of, you know, technician, you know, in electronics and engineering. But let's not that. take away from what he did do, which no, was bring a lot, good, lot of energy and taught me a lot. And I would use him again. Yes, but he's so definite about things, you know. I know what I want, you see. Yes. But Phil's more... When I say to Phil, I want this, he gets at me. Mm. Like that, you know. Um, in, Thank you. I know, you know, he, if he hears the ball, he can... No, no, no. The spectre, you can hear Spectre on the album, you know, and uh, you can hear me. No, he, no, no, that was me. No. I did that before Phil came, you see. Right. right, exactly. I did quite a, quite a lot of it before. And he also came. that mother bell, you know, he was saying it's a church bell and it's connected with his childhood. He was always saying, you know, some days I heard church bell, you know. Yeah, I wrote an, I, I, I had, I read an article on some new southern country singer who wrote something about Sunday's lonely days. That feeling. Okay. In, your, in, the, in past records, uh, you know, it's always, uh, you know, well, Sergeant Peppers, you know, come see the show. Yeah. Come on, come around, listen to us. And then this, this record is so personal, you know. Well, that, what see, Paul said come and see the show. I mean, I didn't, you know. What do you, uh, I said, I read the news today, oh boy, you know, that's what I said. I'm Mr. Kite, mind you. <laughs> but, you know, so I can't... You're Mr. Kite. No, no, I, I never thought, I wrote that as a pure poetic job, you know, to write a song. I was sitting there and I wanted, I had to write because it was time to write, you know. And I had to write it quick because otherwise I wouldn't have been on the album. <laughs> so I had to knock off a few songs. I knocked off it, Day in the Life, or my section of it. And uh, whatever we were talking about, Mr. Kite and something like that. I was very paranoid in those days. I could hardly move. In, uh, in, in, uh, I read that, uh, a little interview, uh, uh, a around when you went to the Rock Motor by in Toronto. And uh, it said you, you said you were throwing up before you went on. Yeah, 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 I was. And you know, off the oh, cuff, we were, we were full of junk too. Yeah. But throwing up. Oh yeah, throwing up. I just threw up for hours till I went on. I nearly threw up in cold. I was. I read a review in Stone about the film, which I haven't seen yet. We're meant to see it tomorrow. That rock and roll. And they're saying, you know, I was this and that, and I was throwing up nearly in the number. I could hardly sing any of them. I was. I was so. I was full of shit, you know. Would you still be that nervous if you're in public? Always that nervous, you know. But with what with one thing and another, <laughs> it was it just had to come out some way, you know. I don't think I'll do much appealing. It's not worth the strain, you know. I don't want to perform too much for people. What do you think of George's album? Uh, I don't know, you know. I think it's all right, you know. When you know, personally, at home, I wouldn't play that kind of music. You know, I don't want to hurt George's feelings. I mean, I don't know how to say about it. You know, I think it's better than Paul's. What do you think of Paul? I thought Paul's was rubbish. You know, 
I, I think he'll make a better one when he's frightened into it. But I thought that first one was just a load of... I told you, light and whatever, you know, that crack. But when I hear, listen to the radio and I hear George's stuff coming over, well, then it's pretty bloody good, you know. It's like that. But I personal tastes are very strange, you know. What are your personal tastes? Huh? Wop Wop Aluma. <laughs> you know? I mean, I like rock and roll, man. I, I don't like much else. John Lennon, The Rolling Stone Interview, Part 2. Why, why rock and roll? That's the music I was, that inspired me to play music, you know. There's nothing conceptually better than rock and roll. No, no group, uh, be it Beatles, Dylan or Stones, has ever improved on a whole lot of shaking, for my money. Or, and maybe I'm like our parents, you know, that's my period, I dig it, you know, and I'll, I never leave it, you know. What do you think of the rock and roll scene today? Uh, I don't know what it is, you know, you'd have to name it. I don't think there's... Do you gain pleasure over the top ten? Uh, no, I never listen, only when I'm recording or, or about to bring something out. And I listen just before I record, I like about a few albums to see what people are doing, you know, if they improved any or what, has anything happened. And nothing's really happened. There's a lot of great guitarists and musicians around, but nothing's happening, you know. I mean, I, I don't like the, the blood, sweat and tears shit. I think all that is bullshit, you know. And uh, it's, rock and roll is doing like jazz, as far as I can see, and the bullshitters are going off into that excellent, excellentness, which I never believed in, and others are going off. I consider myself in the avant-garde of rock and roll, I don't know, because I'm with, Yoko taught me a lot and I taught her a lot, and I think on her album you can hear it, if I can get away from her album for a minute. And I think it's going like that, you know. What do you think it's doing? I thought it wasn't much, you know. I thought it... Because uh, I expect more, you know. I, maybe I expect too much from people, you know. But I expect more. You know? But uh, I haven't been a Dylan follower since he stopped rocking, you know. I like Rolling Stone and a few things he did then, you know. I like a few things he did in the early days, but the rest of it's just like, you know, McCartney or something, you know. It's no different, you know. It's a myth. You don't think then that... It's a legitimate new morning. No, it's a lot of bullshit. It might be a new morning for him because he, you know, because he stopped singing on, uh, on the top of his... How up there? And he's singing down there. I mean, it's all right, but it's nothing, you know. It doesn't mean a fucking thing. I'd sooner have... Uh, let me see what else. I'd sooner have I hear you knocking by Dave Edmonds, this top of England now. You win a wheel, left me long time ago, all that. Um, I'm George Zelfie with, you know, just... It's strange that he comes out with this Harry Krishna Gita LP. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come out with the opposite. Yeah. Thank you, react to that. Well, um, I don't know. I think, uh, probably, I can't imagine what George thinks, you know, but I suppose he thinks I've, I've lost the way, you know, <laughs> or something like that. But to me, I'm, like, home, you know. I'll never change much from this. Let, let's reproach that. It, always, always the Beatles were talked about and the Beatles talked about themselves in four parts of the same person. Yeah, well, to make the, yeah. What's happened to those four parts? Well, they, 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 did, they remembered that they were four individuals, you see. We believe the Beatles myth too. You know. I don't know whether the others still believe it, but, you know. We were four guys that, uh, I met Paul and said, do you want to join me band, you know? And then George joined, and then Ringo joined. We were just a band who made it very, very big, that's all. You know, and sometimes our best work was never recorded, you know. Why? Because we were, we were performers, in spite of what Mick says about us, in Liverpool, Hamburg, and around the dance halls, you know. And what we generated was fantastic when we played straight rock. And there was nobody to touch us in Britain, you know. But as soon as we made it, we made it. The, the, the edges were knocked off. You know, Brian put us in suits and all that, and we made it very, very big, but we sold out, you know. And the music was dead, 
before we even went on the theatre tour of Britain, we were, we, were, we were feeling shit already because we had to reduce an hour or two hours playing, which we were glad in one way, to 20 minutes and go on and repeat the same 20 minutes every night. The Beatles' music died then as, as musicians. That's why we never improved, you know, as musicians. We killed ourselves then to make it. And that was the end of it. And uh, George and I are more inclined to say that, you know. We always missed the club days because that's when we were playing music. And then later on we became technically efficient recording artists, which was another thing because we were competent people, you know, and we can, whatever media you put us in, we can produce something worthwhile. You know? how, do you, how do you rate yourself as a guitar musician? Uh, well, it depends what kind of guitarist, you know. I'm okay, you know. I can't, I'm not technically very good, but I can make it fucking howl, you know, and move. I was rhythm guitarist, you know, and it's, it's an important job. Uh, I can make a, a band drive, you know. How do you rate George? Uh, he's pretty good, you know. <laughs> I prefer myself, you know, I have to be honest, you know. I mean, I'm really very embarrassed about my guitar playing in one way, because it's... It's very poor, you know, I can never move. Maybe but I can make you. a guitar speak, yeah. you know. I, I think there's a guy called Richie Valens, no, Richie Haven. Did he play very strange guitar, you know? Uh, he's a black guy that was on Isle of Wight concert, sang Strawberry Fields or something. Oh, Richie Haven? Yeah, he plays like one chord all the time. Now, he plays pretty funky guitar, but he doesn't seem to be able to play in the real term. I'm like that, you know. But Yoko's made me get cocky about my guitar, because she keeps saying... Why? He, he yeah, if I play you... Okay. Guitar. See, one part of me says, yes, of course I can play, because I can, I, can make, I can make a rock move, you know. But the other part of me says, well, I wish I could just do it like B.B. King, you know. If you put me with B, I'll feel silly, you know. But I can really make a, a... I can... I'm an artist, and if you give me a tuba, I'll bring you something out of it. You said that you played the... You say you can you can make the guitar speak. What songs have you done that on? Uh, I found out. I think it's nice. You know. It drives along. You know. It's it. I don't know. You know. Ask Eric Clapton. He thinks I can play. <laughs> <laughs> Ask him. You know. He said you, can you know. I. I. It's. You don't have to see a lot. A lot of you people see want technical. Thing. Then you think. Oh, well, that is. A, it's like wanting technical films. You know, most critics of rock and roll and guitarists are in the stage of the 50s where they wanted a technic technically perfect film, you know, finished for them, and then they would feel happy. I'm a cinema verite guitarist or musician, and you have to break down your barriers to be able to hear what I'm playing, you know. Yeah, I, it's a nice little bit I played. I had it on the back of Abbey Road. Paul gave us each a piece, you know. There's a little break where Paul plays, George plays, and I play. Well, you listen to it, you know. Which is that? Um, there's one bit, one of those where it stops, um, you know, one of those carry that weight, and then suddenly it goes boom, boom, boom on the drums, and then we all take it in turns to play. I'm the third one on it. The, I have a definite style of playing. I always had, but I was overshadowed. Like, they call about George the invisible singer. I'm the invisible guitarist, you know. You said you played the obligato on Get Back. Oh, I played the solo on that, yeah. When Paul was feeling kind, he'd give me a solo. You know, or if he, maybe if he was feeling guilty that he'd had most of the A-sides or something, he'd give me a solo, you know? And I played the solo on that. Um, I think George produces some beautiful guitar playing, you know? But I think he's too hung up to really let go. But so is Eric, really. You know? Maybe he's changed. They're all so hung up, you know? Well, we all are. That's the problem. But I really like B.B. King. Do you like Ringo's record, his country one? I think it's a good record. I wouldn't buy any of it, you know? I think it's a good record, and I was pleasantly surprised to hear uh, Boku of Blues, that song, you know. I thought, good, you know, I was glad, and I wasn't, I didn't feel as embarrassed as I did about his first record, you know. But I, I, it's hard for you to ask me. It's like asking you, what, what do I think of, ask me about other people, you know, because it so, looks so awful when I say I don't like this and I don't like that. It's just that I wouldn't, you know, I don't like many of the Beatles records either, you know. My own taste is different from that which I've played sometimes, which is called cop-out, you know, to make money or whatever, or because I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. I'd I like to talk to this, I'd like to talk to ask more questions about Paul. 
and uh, uh, go through that. Um, what, let, let me ask you this. We went and saw Let It Be in San Francisco. Yes. What was your feelings then? Uh, I, I felt sad, you know. Also felt that that film was set up by Paul for Paul. That's one of the main reasons the Beatles ended, you know, because I can't speak for George, but I have I pretty damn well know we got fed up of of being sidemen for Paul. After Brian died, that's what happened began to happen to us, you know. And the, the camera work was set up to show Paul and not to show anybody else. And that's how I felt about it. And on top of that, the people that cut it, cut it as Paul is God and we're just lying around there, you know. And that's what I felt. You know? And I knew there were some shots of Yoko and, and me that had been just chopped out of the film for no other reason than the people were oriented towards Engelbert Humberdinck. You know, and that's I felt sick. How, how would you trace the breakup of the Beatles? After Brian died, we collapsed. Paul took over and su supposedly led us, you know. Mm -hmm. But what is leading us when we went round in circles? How we broke up then. When that did you that was the disintegration. You know. We'll be here a long time, so. When did you first when did you first feel that the Beatles had broken up? When did you first that idea first issue? I don't remember, you know. I was in my own pain. I wasn't noticing really. I just did it like a like a job, you know. The Beatles broke up at, at, you know after Brian died, we made the, the double album. The, the, the set it's it's like if you took each track off and gave it all put all mine and all your it's just like I told you many times, you know, just me and a backing group, Paul and a backing group. And I enjoyed it, you know. But we broke up then, you know. Where, where were you when you Brian died? We were in uh, Wales with Maharishi. We'd just gone down after seeing his lecture the first night. And we went down to Wales and we heard it then, you know. And then we went right off into the Maharishi where thing. In Wales, a place called Bangor in Wales. We Mah like in hotel, no, we were uh, just in a, outside a lecture hall with Maharishi. And some... I don't know, it just sort of, I can't remember, you know, it just sort of came over. Somebody came up to us, the press were there, because we'd gone down with this strange Indian, you know. And they said, Brian's dead, and we, we I was st stunned, you know, and we all were, I suppose. And the Maharishi, we went into, well, what, you know, you know, he's dead and all that, and he was sort of saying, oh, forget it, you know, be happy, fucking idiot. You know, like parents, you know, smile. That's what Maharishi said. So, and we did, and we were along, along with the Maharishi trip. You know. What was your feeling when Brian died? Uh, the feeling that anybody has when somebody close to them dies, there's a sort of little hysterical, sort of hee hee, I'm glad it's not me, or something in it. You know, that funny feeling when somebody dies, I don't know whether you've had it, I've had a lot of people die on me, you know. And the other feeling is, gee, you know, what, what the fuck, you know. What what can I do? You know, I mean, what I I I knew that we were in trouble then. I had never I didn't really have any misconceptions about our ability to do anything other than play music. And uh, I was scared. You know, I thought we fucking had it now. What was it? Mm Would -hmm. you pass me that pepper mm -hmm. there, the bit of it? What what was it? The events, you know, sort of that immediately happened after Brian died. I mean, that but we went with Maharishi, I don't know, I remember being in Wales and then, I can't remember, you know, I mean, it's, I'll probably have to have a bloody session to remember it, so I can't, don't remember, you know, it just all happened, you know. And then you went to India? Yeah, I think so. What about the funeral? Oh, that was bullshit, you know, I was, I was defended enough, I'd forgotten. No, I didn't. It was funerals. How did Paul? I don't know how the others took it. I never tell how. No, it's no good asking me. It's like me asking how you took it. You know, I I don't know. I'm in my own head. You know, I can't be in anybody else's. I don't know what really what George, Paul, and Ringo think any more than I do about. You know, I know them pretty well, but I don't know anybody that well. You know, 
Yoko, I know about the best, you know. It, you can't, I don't know how they felt, it was in my own thing. It was just, we were all just like dazed, you know. Uh, so, so Brian died, and then you said, then what happened is Paul started to take over. Well, that's, Paul, he, I mean, you know, Paul, I think Paul, I don't know how much of this I want to put out, I tell you. I think Paul had an impression, he has it now like a parent, that uh, we should be thankful for what he did, you know. But he kept for, for keeping the Beatles going. But when you look upon it objectively, he kept it going for his own sake, you know. But not for my sake did he, Paul struggle. But Paul made an attempt to carry on as if Brian hadn't died, you know, by saying, now, now, boys, we're going to make a record. You know, and being the kind of person I am, I thought, well, we're, you know, we're going to make a record, all right. So I went along, we went and made a record. And I suppose we made Pepper, I'm not sure, you know. That was before. Well, that was before Brian. Oh, I see. Well, we made the double album then. Mm -hmm. But it was like that, you know. I mean, uh, and then, was My Little Mystery Tour after Brian? Yeah, well, that was the, the real. See, I think Paul had a tendency to come along and say, well, he's written his ten songs. Let's record now. And I said, well, give us a few days <laughs> and I'll knock a few off, you know, or something. I don't imagine Mystery Tour was another where he'd set it up. Uh, you know, and then, then he did worked it out with Mal, and then he came and showed me what his idea was, and this is how it went. It went around like this, the story, and he had it all, you know, think production, and he says, well, here's the segment, you write a little piece for that. And I think, fucking hell, I've never made a film. What do you mean? You think, write a script. So, you know, I ran off and, and wrote the dream sequence for the fat woman and all the thing with the spaghetti and all that. And, and all that. It was like that, you know. And then we were all, George and I were sort of, grumbling, you know, fucking movie, you know, well, we better do it, you know, a feeling that we, we owed the public or owed somebody other that we should do these things, you know. So we made it, you know. When, when, did, your, when did your song writing partnership with Paul end? That ended, I don't know, around 1962 or something, I don't know. I mean, if you give me the albums, I can tell you exactly who wrote what, you know, and which line. I mean, we, we sometimes wrote together and sometimes didn't, but all our best work. Apart from the early days, like I Want to Hold Your Hand, we wrote together and things like that. Uh, we wrote apart always, you know. Even Liverpool, one after 909 on the What's It LP, it's one I wrote when 17 or 18 in Liverpool, separately from Paul, and, and uh, some of his, uh, uh, I don't know, The Sun is Fading Away and things like that were things Paul wrote those days. We always wrote separately, but we wrote together because because we enjoyed it a lot sometimes and also because they'd say, well, you're going to make an album, we'd get together and knock off a few songs, you know. Just like a, a job. Whose idea was to go to India? Well, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Probably George's. I have no idea. You know. No. no, no. We met around there. But around there. I was going to take it, but I, I, back, I lost my nerve because I was going to take my wife and Yoko, and I didn't know how to work it, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't quite do it. Sexy Sadie wrote that about Maharishi. That, that's about Maharishi. You know. I, I copped out and wouldn't write Maharishi. What have you done? You made a fool of everyone. When did but now it can be told, <laughs> fab listeners. When did you realize that he was making a fool of you? Mm, I don't know. I just sort of saw him, you know. While in India, when yeah, somebody said, you know, there was a big hullabaloo about him raping Mia Farrow and all, trying to get off with Mia Farrow and a few other women and things like that. And we went down to him and we'd stayed up all night discussing was it true or not true, you know. And when George started thinking it might be true, well, I thought, well, it must be true because if George is doubting it, there must be something in it. So we went to see Maharaj. The whole gang was the next day charged down to his hut, you know, his bungalow, his very ex rich looking bungalow. In the in the mountains, and uh, I I was the spokesman. As usual, when the dirty work came, I actually had to be leader. Whatever the scene was, when it came to the nitty gritty, I had to do the speaking. And I said, uh, "We're leaving." Why? <laughs> you know all that shit. <laughs> and uh, I said, "Well, if you're so cosmic, you'll know why." You know, because he was always intimating, and there were all, all these his right hand men intimating that he did miracles. You know. And I was saying, you know why? You know. He said, I don't know why, you must tell me. And I just kept saying, and he gave me a look like, you know, I'll kill you bastard. He gave me such a look. And I knew then when he looked at me, you know, because I'd called his bluff. I said, if you, if you know, you know all. 
you know, cosmic conscious. That's what we're all here for. And I was a bit rough to him, you know. You're expecting too much from him. I always do, you know. <laughs> I always expect too much. I always expect him my mother and yeah. don't get her. That's what it is, you know. Or, or some parents. I know that much. So when did you decide you had to come to New York and out Denounce him. Well, you came to New York and had the press conference. The Apple thing. That was to announce Apple. That w- but also at the same time. I don't remember that. Well, what did I say? I don't know. You know, I mean, we all say a lot of things that we don't know what we're talking about. I'm probably doing it now. I don't know what I said. You know, see, everybody takes you up on the words you said in that. I'm just a guy who people ask what what about things. I blab off, and some of it makes sense. Some of it's bullshit, and some of it's lies, and some of it's God knows what I'm saying. You know. I don't know what I said about Maharishi, all I know, we said about Apple, which is worse, you know. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Clive Epstein, or some other such business freak, came up to us and said, you've got to spend so much money or the tax will take it. We're thinking of opening some retail... Uh, it wasn't record shop, it's a chain of retail clothes or some balmy thing like that. And we were all muttering about, well, if we're going to have to open a shop, let's open something we're interested in. You know, and we went through all these different I- ideas about this, that and the other, and we ended up with the... Paul had a nice idea about opening up a, a white house where it would sell white china and things like that, everything white, you know, because you can never get anything white, you know, which is pretty groovy. And that, it didn't end up with that. It ended up with Apple with all this junk and the fool and all their stupid clothes and all that. And then... How did you, when, when did you decide to close that down? Uh, I don't know. I, I was controlling the scene at the time. You know, I mean, I was the one going in the office and mm-hmm. shouting about Paul had, gone up. Paul had done it for six months. I walked in and changed everything. But they're all, all the Peter Browns were reporting behind me back to Paul saying, hey, you know, John's doing this and... He's doing that, and like John's crazy. I was always the one that was must be crazy because I wouldn't let him have status quo. And uh, we, I came up the uh, was it my idea or yours? Well, we came up the idea to give it all away and stop puck, fucking about with psychedelic clothes shop. So we gave it all away. Were you there for the giveaway? No, no, we read it in the papers. That was when we started events. I learned events from Yoko. Mm-hmm. No events we did. We made everything into event from then on and got rid of it. Mm-hmm. When you gave away your MBE, gave it yeah, back. Yeah. I'd been planning on it for over a year and a bit, you know. I was waiting for the time to do it. You said, you said then that you, you were waiting to tag it to some event, and then you yeah. realized that it was an event in it. Yeah, yeah, that's the truth. You also said at that time that you, you had another thing you were going to do. I don't know what it was. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. We had some, well, we always kept them on the toes, you know. <laughs> During our events <laughs> period, I don't know. We said, well, we got some other surprise for them later. Mm. I can't remember what it was. Maybe we were getting married. Said, no, we were married. I don't know. You mean after the baby? Event? After the MBE, we said yes. we probably intimated that we had another surprise event coming up shortly. Well, probably that was the war is over. Well, probably the war is over poster event, maybe. Um. So to go to to go back to Apple sort of in the, in the breakup of the Beatles, and um, Brian died, went to India. I didn't really want to do all this, you know. Go on. Well, we've been, we've, we're halfway through it now, so let's do it. You said you quit the Beatles first. Yeah. How? Well, I said to Paul, I'm leaving. Uh, we were in Apple, and I just, on the way over to, I knew before I went to Toronto, I told Alan I was leaving, I told Eric Clapton and Klaus that I was leaving, and I'd like to probably use them as a group, you know. I hadn't decided how to do it, uh, to have a permanent new group or or what, and then I, uh, later on I thought, fuck it, I'm not going to get stuck with another set of people, you know, whoever they are. So, but I, I announced it to myself and to the people around me on the way to Toronto a few days before, or, or, and on the plane Alan came with me, I told Alan, you know, it's over. And uh, uh, and then when I got back, there was a few meetings, and Alan had said, well, cool it, cool it, because there was a lot to do, you know, <laughs> business-wise. It wouldn't have been suitable at the time, you know. 
And then we were discussing something in the office with Paul, and uh, Paul was saying something or other, like, like to do something. or And I kept saying no, no, no uh, to everything he said, you see. So it came to a point I had to say something. Now Paul said, well, what do you mean then? So I said, I mean, uh, uh, the group's over, I'm leaving. And, but Alan was there, he, he'll remember exactly, and she will, this is my, how I see it. Uh, Alan was saying, don't tell, he didn't want me to tell Paul even, you know. And, but I couldn't help, so I told him, it's out, you know, I couldn't stop it, it came out. Mm -hmm. And Paul and Alan said, they were glad that I wasn't going to announce it, that I was going to make an event out of it, you know. <laughs> right? But Paul and Alan both, I don't know whether Paul said don't tell anybody, but he was damn pleased that I wasn't, you know. He said, oh, well, that means nothing really happened if you're not going to say anything. So what that's what happened. Said, well, I mean, like, like anybody when you say divorce, you know, the face goes all sorts of colours. It's like he knew all, really, but this was the final thing, you know. And then six months later, he comes out with whatever, you know. I told Ray Conley, so a lot of people knew I'd left, but... I was a fool not to do it, you know. Well, not to do what Paul did, which is use it to sell a record. You were really angry with Paul. No, I wasn't angry. Well, when he came out with his, I'm leaving. Well, I wasn't angry. I was just, <laughs> shit! You know, I mean, he, he's a good PR man, Paul. I mean, he, he's about the best in the world, probably. You know. He really does a job. I was just, I wasn't angry in that way. I was, uh, we were all hurt that he didn't tell us that what he was going to do, but he, I think he claims that he didn't mean that to happen, but that's bullshit. He called me in the afternoon of that day and said, I'm doing what you and Yoko were doing last year. Last year. And I said, good, you know, because the, the, the time last year, they were all looking at us too as if we were strange trying to make a life together and doing other things than being fab, fat myths. So he rang me up on that day and said, I'm doing what you and Yoko are doing, and putting on armor, and I'm leaving the group too, he said. I said, good, you know, I was a little, you know, feeling a little strange, because he was saying it this time, you know, although it was a year later. And I said, well, I said, good, you know, that's it. You know, he, because he was the one that wanted the Beatles most. You know. And, and then yeah, the no. midnight papers came out, you know. And I was cursing because I hadn't done it. <laughs> He certainly sold a record that hey. virtually didn't have any message in it. You know, it's one of those... Well, um, that people, you don't have to have a message in a record, but he just did a great hype, you know. I just uh, I missed the... I wanted to do it, you know. I should have done it. I think, damn shit, what a fool I was. <laughs> but there were many pressures at that time. I think Northern Song, all that was going. It would have upset the whole thing if I just said that. When you found out that the James had this all the shirt. I was pissed off, you know. Did you do the trade? Sure do, you know. I mean he's another one of them people, a bit like Martin, who think they made us, you know. And they didn't. I'd like to hear Dick James music and I'd like to hear George Martin's music, mm. please. Just play me some. And Dick James actually has said that, you know. That he made us. They, they, people are under a delusion that they made us, you know. What did, they, how did Dick James tell you, well, I'm not? He didn't tell us, it was, he did it. It was just a fait accompli, you know. He went and sold his thing to Lou Grade. And that's all we knew. We read it in the paper, I think, you know. What was that fight like with Lou Grade? That was fa fantastic. You know. It was like this room full of old men smoking and fighting, you know you know, decided on playing. It's great. I mean, uh, people seem to think businessmen like Alan O'Grade or any of them are, are not uh, are a race apart. They play the game the way we play music, you know. And it's something to see, you know. They play a game, you know. And then they have ritual and they create... They, you know, like Alan is a very creative guy, you know. Mm. He creates situations which create positions for them to move in. They all do it, you know. And it was a sight to see, you know. And I, we played our part. We both did. <laughs> well, <laughs> with the bankers and things like that, I think Alan will tell you better, because I don't know, I forget Frightman at all. Everything seems as though it's going to be trouble, you know, like you can't say anything about anybody because you get sued or something. So 
You can check Alan with that. He'll tell you what we did. I did a great... Well, no, no, I, I don't know. I did a job on this banker, you know, that we were using on rod, that's all. And a few other people, and on the Beatles. Well, how do you describe the job, you know? My job is, I manoeuvre people, you know, that's what leaders do, you know? And I sit, make situations in which it a benefit to me with other people. It's as simple as that. Oh, I, I think you should cut that out. Why? It's, that's the way you always feel, but actually you're, you're you know, you can never... I am manoeuvred like too. Yourself. Yeah, well, okay, but, um, you know, I had, I had to do a job to get Alan in Apple. Exactly. I did a job, so did you. You do it, you do it with instinct, you know. Not well, it doesn't matter. Man oh, God, you know, don't say that. Maneuvering is what it is. Let's not be coy about it. It's a deliberate mm -hmm. and, and thought-out maneuver of how to get a situation how we want it. That's how life's about, isn't it? <coughs> is it not? How did you go back? Is it? Well, you're a pretty instinctive guy. Yeah. But instinctive doesn't matter. So is Alan. So is Dick James. Okay. So is Gray. They're all instinctive. So is he. I mean, it's instinct, but it's manoeuvring. There's nothing ashamed about it. We all do it. It's just a, a, owning up. You know, not going around saying, God bless you, Brother Hari, fucking Krishna, and doing it, pretending there's no well, interest. You see, the difference is that you don't go to Alan and bush it and get him. But you just instinctively trust that Alan is the guy. No, but and I you jump into it and you just get But him. that's not the thing. The point I'm talking about is creating a situation around Apple and the Beatles in which Alan could come in. Yes, right. That You're right. is what I'm talking about. How and he you? wouldn't have got in unless I'd done it. Right. And, uh, and he wouldn't have got in unless you'd done it. You made the decision, too. How did you get Alan? The same as I get anything I want, you know. I mean, the same as you get what you want. I'm not telling you. Just work at it and get on the phone and a little word here and a little word there and do it, you know. Mm. What was Paul's reaction? See, a lot of people, all of Dick James and the Derek Taylors and Peter Brown, all of them, you know, they think they're the Beatles and Neil and all of them. Well, I say, fuck them. <laughs> you know, and they all, after working with uh, genius for 10, 15 years, begin to think they're it, you know. So, they're not. Do you think you're genius? Yes. If there's such a thing as one, I'm, I am one, you know. When did you first realize? When I was about 12, you know. I used to think, I must be a genius, but nobody's noticed. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, I'm a genius or I'm mad? Which is it? I, I said, I can't be mad because nobody's put me away, therefore I'm a genius. I mean, genius is a form of madness, and we're all that way, you know. But I used to be a bit coy about it, like my guitar playing, you know. Uh, if there's such a thing as genius, which is just what? What the fuck is it? I am one, you know, <laughs> and if there isn't, I don't care, you know. But I used to think when I was a kid, you know, writing me poetry and doing me paintings. I didn't become something when the Beatles made it or when you heard about me. I've been like this all my life. Genius is pain, too. It's just pain, you know. How do you feel towards the Beatles? Who, the apple? The, the apple. Yeah. I mean, you talk about now and... I didn't mention Mal. I said Neil, Peter Brown, and Derek. They live in a dream of Beatle past, and everything they do is oriented to that. They also have a warped view of what was happening, you know? And, uh, I mean, they must feel now that their lives, their lives are just inextricably bound up in yours. Well, they have to grow up then, you know, because they've only had half their life. They've got another whole half to go, and they can't go on pretending to be Beatles. That's where it's at, you know. They don't know. They don't. I mean, when they read it, they think it's crack, crack, John, if it's in the article. But that's what it's at. They live in the past, you know. Um, you traveled. You traveled to Toronto with Derek, right? Yeah. And also did a bed piece with Derek. That was the tr same thing, yeah. Well, then I was living in the past, too, then. I was reading... Uh, uh, See, I presumed that uh, I would just be able to carry on and just bring Yoko into our life, but it seemed that I had to, had to be married to them or Yoko, and I chose Yoko, you know, and I was right. What was it, What were their reactions when you, when you first brought Yoko by? And they despised her, you know. From the very beginning? Yeah, right. 
and they insult her and they still do. Yeah, they don't, they don't even know I can see it. And even when it's written down, it'll look like I'm just paranoid or she's paranoid, but I'm, I know, you know, just by the way that publicity on us was handled in Apple. All the two years we were together and the attitude of people to us and the, the, the bits we hear from the office girls and the... We know, you know, so they can go stuff themselves. In the beginning, you were too much in love to notice yeah. anything else. Yeah, we, we were in our own dream, you know. Mm. But, I mean, they're, they're the kind of idiots that really think that Yoko split the Beatles, probably, or Alan, you know, that it's the same joke, you know. They're that, they're that, they're that insane about Alan, too. John Lennon, The Rolling Stone Interview, Part 3. How, how would, I mean, how would you, char how would you characterize uh, John and Paul and John and Beatles? George, Paul, and Ringo's reaction to Uh It's the same. You can, put, well, you can quote Paul. You can look at it in the papers. He says many times that at first he hated... Yoko, and then he got to like her. It's too late for me, you know, and for Yoko, you know. Why should she take that kind of shit from those people? You know, they're writing about her looking miserable and let it be. You sit through 60 sessions with the most big-headed, uptight people on earth and see what it's fucking like and be insulted by it just because you love someone. That's... Uh, and George gave her... was insulted her right to her face in, in, in Apple office at the beginning, just being straightforward. You know, that game of, well, I'm going to be up front because this is what I've heard, and Dylan and a few people said you've got a lousy name in New York, and uh, you, you give off bad vibes. That's what George said to her, and we both sat through it, and I didn't hit him, I don't know why. But I was always hoping that they'd come round. I, I couldn't believe it, you know. And they all sat there with their wives like a fucking jury and judged us. And the only thing I did was write that piece about some of our beast friends and in my usual way, because I, I was never honest. I always had to write it in that gobbledygook. And that's what they did to us. Ringo was all right, so was Maureen. Mm. But the other two really gave it to us. You know, I never forgive them. You know, I don't care what fucking shit about Hare Krishna and God and Paul about, well, I've changed my mind. You know. I don't forgive them for that. Some people said that when with Paul's album that came out and had stayed in our cover, said that was done as a deliberate, you know, insult to Ian Yoko because he was not have a day. No, I don't think he did that. I think he was just Im imitating us as they usually do by putting out a family album, you know. They, they do, you watch, they do exactly what I do a year or two later. What are you <laughs> this is going to be some fucking thing. I don't, you know, it's the end of it. Um, They're imitators, you know. What do you think people will do uh, with the, this new album, you know? Mine? Yeah, I mean, in terms of imitating and coming along later. Well, I have no idea, you know. I, I, see I, Stephen Stills or uh, George Bates, the guitar player, coming out with a, a statement. I do believe that's what will happen, you know. But we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> it's a fantastic, uh, strong album, you know. So one way or the I personally it. will be do it, will yeah. probably come out with Wop Wop Luma or something. You know, I mean, I've said it for a, for a you bit. You said it's enough for ten years. Actually. Yeah. When did you realize that 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 you're just not going to be unable to reconcile Paul and George to Yoko? I don't know when it was when I decided when to leave the group. You know. Yeah. I mean, I wanted Yoko. You know. I, Yoko played me a tape sound of sort of work. I know it was very strange, and, and avant-garde music is a tough thing to assimilate and all that. But uh, I've heard the Beatles playing avant-garde music when nobody's looking for years, you know. But they're artists, and all artists have fucking big egos, mm. whether they like to admit it or not. And when a new artist came into the group, there was never allowed. Now, sometimes George and I would like to bring somebody in like Billy Preston. That was exciting. We would have had him in the group, you know. We were fed up with the same old 
shit. But it wasn't, it wasn't wanted, and I would have expanded the Beatles, broken the myth, and, and either get their pants off, you know, and stop being God. But it didn't work. It didn't work. And Yoko was naive. She came in and would expect to perform with them like you would with any group. She was jamming, you know. But there'd be a sort of coldness about it. So. I mean, when I decided to leave the group, that's when I decided, you know, that I could no longer artistically get anything out of the Beatles. And, I would, and here was somebody that could turn me on to a million things. How did you choose the musician for you? I'm a very nervous person, really. I'm not as big-headed as this tape sounds, you no. know. Uh-huh. This is me projecting through the fear, you know. But uh, so I choose people that that I know rather, that rather than strangers, you know. Like, like, uh, you bring them. Yeah. Why, why do you get along with them? Because, uh, because in spite of all the things, that the Beatles really could play music together when they weren't uptight. And if I get a thing going, Ringo knows where to go, you know. Like that. And he, he does what? Mm. He, We've played together so long that it fits, you know. I mean, that's the only thing I sometimes miss is is being able to just sort of blink or make a, a certain noise, and I know they'll all know where we're going on an ad lib thing. But uh, it's it's I don't miss it that much, you know. Um, you always said that. You know, for the Beatles, you wanted the, the, Be- the Beatles wanted to be bigger than Elvis. Yeah. Why? Because Elvis was the biggest. We wanted to be the biggest, you know. Doesn't everybody, you know. When did you decide that? Well, first of all, we wanted to, say, Paul and I wanted to be the Goffin and King of England. This was an old story, you know, because Goffin and King were writing this great stuff at that time. And then we decide, well, we can, we're better than them, so we want to be this, you know, we want to be the world. It's just like, we want to be this, we want to be the next thing, you know, we want to be president or whatever. goes on and on and on. But we always wanted to be bigger than Elvis, because Elvis was the thing. Whatever we say, he was it. At what moment did you realize then you were bigger than Elvis? I don't know. I don't know, you know. See, it's, it's different when it happens, you've forgotten about it. It's like, you know, when you get actually get the number one or whatever it is, it's different. It's the going for it, which is the fun. And then at, at some point, you just, just never thought about it again. Yeah, yeah, we were just uh, like jelly. We sat in the mold and we floated about like that. Um, in the, you, you know, part of, you, you say the dream is, part of the dream or is, uh, was the, the Beatles of God. And the Beatles is the message of God. And the Beatles is being God, or yourself is being God. Yeah, I mean, if, the, if like, if there is a God, we're, we're all it. Yeah. Right, but, I mean, what I'm trying to think of is, when did you first start getting uh, the, you know, reactions from people who would listen to, you know, listen to the record, the first sort of spiritual reactions, people? This record? No, the, the, the Beatles. Record. Uh, there's a guy in England called William Mann who writes in the Times of the Rose, the first intellectual review of the Beatles, which got people talking about us in that intellectual way. It was, yeah, he wrote about Aeolian cadences and all sort of musical terms. And he's a bullshitter, you know, but he made us, and he still he wrote about Paul's album as if it was written by Beethoven, this last one. He's just about the album of the year and all that shit, you know. And he's written his, he's still writing the same shit, you know. But it did us a lot of good in that way because people, also, all the middle classes and intellectuals, are going, "Oh, you know, well, aren't they clever?" The message thing. The message thing about love and that. Well, that when did first somebody come up to you with it, with it, thing, with the John and his God? No, I don't. The how, what, how, what to do and all that. Uh, you know, like you tell us, Guru, that yeah. bit. Uh, probably after acid. Yeah, well, I don't know, rubber so I can't quite remember, you know. I don't, I can't remember it exactly happening, you know. We just took that position, you know. I mean, we, we started putting out messages, you know. I, I, like the word, and the word is love, and things like that. And I was all, I like messages, you know, I mean. <laughs> oh, strawberry fields, I mean. No, that's later on, this is earlier on, you see. Yeah. 
See, when you start putting out messages, people start coming asking you, what, what's the message? You know? let, 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 how did you first get involved with LSD? Uh, a dentist in London <laughs> put it, laid it on George, me, and our wives without telling us at a dinner party at his house. He was a friend of George's and our dentist at the time. Well, I, and he just put it in our coffee or something, you know. And we went, he, he was saying, I advise you not to. He didn't know what it was. It was just a sort of, you know, it's all the thing, you know, with the sort of the middle class London swingers or whatever had all heard about it and they didn't know it was different from pot or pills and they gave us it and he was saying I advise you not to leave and we thought he was all trying to keep us for an orgy in his house and we didn't want to know you know and we went out to the ad lib and these discotheques and it was incredible things going on and uh, all that's that's how it happened that was around the table and then no no I mean it, this was a dinner and we got out and went went and this guy came with us he was nervous he didn't know what was going what we were going crackers you know <laughs> I mean we did it was insane going around London on it and we thought when we went to the club we thought it was on fire and then we thought it was a premier oh no we thought it was a premier it was just an ordinary light outside we thought shit what's going on here you know and we were cackling in the street and then you know people were shout shouting let's break a window you know we were just insane i mean we just had our heads and people had come up to me and we finally got we got in the lift and we all thought there was a fire in the lift it was just a little red light and we were all screaming like that and it erupted it all hysterical and we all arrived on the floor because this was a discotheque that was up a building you know we get and the lift stops and the door opens and we're all going, ah! and we just see that it's the club and then we walk in you know sit down and we're it's like that all the time. <laughs> You know, and the tables elongate, you know. I think we went to eat before that, and it was like in the thing I'd read about opium, where the table suddenly... I suddenly realised that it was only a table like this with four of us, but it went this long. Just like I'd read somebody... Who's the... Blake, is it? Somebody describing the effects of the opium in the old days. Mm. And I thought, fuck, it's happening, you know. And then we went to the ad lib and all that, and then some oh. singer came up to me and said, can I sit next to you? And I was like, only if you don't talk! <laughs> you know, like... Because <laughs> I was, just couldn't think... When you came down, what did you think? Uh, I was pretty stunned, you know, for a, a month or two. Well, where did you go after that? Well, this, it seemed to go on all night. I can't remember the details. It just went on like that. And then George, somehow or another, managed to drive us home in his Mini. But we were going about 10 miles an hour. It seemed like a 1,000. And uh, Patty was saying, let's jump out and play football, you know, there's these big rugby posts and things like that, and I was getting all this sort of hysterical jokes coming out, like a speed because you know, I was always on that too it was like, oh, you know, and George was going, me laugh ah! and you know, <laughs> God, it was just terrifying you know? <laughs> but it was fantastic I did some drawings at the time, I've got them somewhere like, oh, four faces saying, we all agree with you, you know, and all, things like that I gave them to Ringo, lost the originals I, I did a lot of drawing that night just like that and then George's house seemed to be uh, you know, just like a big submarine, I was driving it. They all went to bed. I was carrying on on my own. It seemed to float above his wall, which was 18 foot. You know, I was right driving them. <laughs> and the second time we had it in L.A., which is different. What happened then? Well, uh, then we took it deliberately. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so, oh, well, to backtrack then. So yeah. after everybody slept. Oh, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember, you know. It was just... Everybody get up. Then, then, then later, I, I can't remember, you know, we're all just a bit down, you know, a bit, wow, you know, I can't, I don't remember the, that kind of thing, I remember the highlights, you know. And then, well, we just decided to take it again in California, yeah. It, well, we were on tour in one of those houses, like, you know, Doris Day's house or whatever it was we used to stay. And the three of us took it, Ringo, George and I, and I think maybe Neil, and a couple of the birds, you know, that, what's his name, the one in the Steels and Nash thing. You know the birds, yeah, B Y R D, Crosby and the other guy who used to be the leader, McGuinn. They came, I think they came around. I'm not sure on a few trips. All, it's like that. But there were some English reporters who was like Don Short and that. And we were in the garden had it. It was only the second one. We still didn't know anything about do it in a nice place and cool it and all that. We just took it, you know. And then we suddenly saw the reporter and we think, how do we act normally? We because we imagined we were acting extraordinary, which we weren't. He thought, surely somebody can see, you know. I was terrified waiting for him to go, and he wondered why he couldn't come over. And Neil, who ne had never had it either, had taken it, and he, he still had to play road manager. We said, go and get rid of Don Short, and he didn't know what to do. He just sort of sat with it. And Peter Fonda came, and that was another thing. And he kept up saying, I know what it's like to be dead. And he said, what? 
Mm-hmm. And he kept saying it, you know, he was saying, for Christ's sake, shut up, we don't care. <laughs> you know, we don't want to know. And he kept going on about it. And that's how I wrote, she said, she said. I know what it's like to be dead. What else mm-hmm. turned into that song? She said, she said. Yeah. I know what it is. Well, it was a sad song, you know. Mm-hmm. That was uh, just an acid song, I suppose. And when I was a little boy, you see. Like, oh, a lot of, you know, early childhood was coming out anyway. So how long did LSD go on? It went on for years. I must have had a thousand trips, you know. Literally a thousand? Or oh, yeah. Like no, lots, you know. I used to just eat it all the time. <laughs> Through what album? I don't know. <laughs> I, we never, I never took it in the studio. I once I did accidentally, I thought it was taking some uppers. And uh, I, I was not in a state of handling it, you know. And uh, and I can't remember what album it was, but I took it and then I just noticed I suddenly got so scared on the mic, you know. I said, I, what was it, you know? I said, I feel ill, I thought I felt ill. And, and it was going, I thought it was going cracked, you know. And then I, I said, I must get some air. And they all took me upstairs on the roof and George Martin was looking at me funny, you know. And then it dawned on me, I must have taken acid. And I said, well, I can't go on, I'll have to go. So I just said, you'll have to do it, and I'll just stay and watch. And I was just, you know, like a very nervous and just watching them all. I said, is it all right? And they were saying, yeah, you know, all being very kind. And I said, yes, it's all right. And I said, are you sure it's all, all right? And I said, all right. You know, and they, they carried on making the record. We, we, the, the other Beatles didn't get into the world as much as we did. Uh, George was pretty. Uh, in LA, Paul felt very out of it because we were all a bit, a bit slightly cruel, you know. So we we're taking it in your not. But we kept seeing him, you know, and we'd be going up and say, and we couldn't eat our food, you know. We, yeah. I just couldn't manage it. We're picking it up with the hands and we say, hey, fucking, the, the, there's all these people sort of serving us in the house and that, and we're just sort of mm, knocking it on the floor and then, oh, like that. And uh, it was a long time before Paul took, and then there was the, the big announcement. You know. So I don't know. I think uh, George is pretty heavy. Huh? We're probably both the most cracked, you know. I think Paul's a bit more stable than, than George and I. Yeah. I don't know about straight, <laughs> stable. <laughs> uh, I think S- LSD profoundly shocked him. To um, what uh, did you expect in the Oh yeah, I had many. <laughs> Jesus Christ! You know, I stopped taking it because of that. You know, I mean, I just couldn't stand, couldn't stand it. You know, and yeah, it got like that. But then I, I, I dropped it for I don't know how long. Then I started taking it just before I met Yoko again. I, I, Derek came over, and uh, see, I, I got the wrong. I got a message on acid that used to destroy your ego, and, and I did. You know. I was reading that stupid book of Leary's and all that shit, you know, we're going through all the, the whole game that everybody went through. And I destroyed myself, you know. And I was slowly putting myself together after Maharishi and that, bit by bit over a two-year period. And then I destroyed my ego, you know, and uh, I didn't believe I could do anything, you know. And uh, I let Paul do what he wanted and say, of them all just do what they wanted. And I just was nothing, I was shit, you know. And, uh, and then Derek tripped me out at his house after he got back from L.A. He said, it's all, you know, it's all, and he sort of said, you're all right. And he pointed out which songs I'd written. And, you know, he said, you, and you wrote this and you said this and you are intelligent. Don't be frightened, you know. And then next week I went down with Yoko and we tripped out again. And, and she f- filled me completely to realize that I was me and it's all right, you know. And uh, that was it, you know. How? And I started fighting again and being a loudmouth again and saying, well, I'm, I can do this and fuck you, you know, and this is what I want. You know, I want it, you know, and uh, don't put me down, you know, I did this. <laughs> so that's why I am now. There's, some of the, there's a lot of obvious things in the music. Yes. Where are some of the obvious things? I mean, if tomorrow never know. Yeah. But then... I mean, how do you think that sort of affected your conception of music in general? Well, it, only, it was only another mirror. It didn't do. It wasn't another miracle, you know. It it was more of a visual thing. And uh, and uh, the therapy, you know, looking at that yourself bit, then it. Well, it did all that, you know. I don't, I don't quite remember, you know, when you hear the music, but it didn't write the music. Neither no. did Janoff Maharishi right. in the same terms. I write the music. 
in the circumstances which I'm in, whether it's on acid or in the water, you know. And in all those trips, you just didn't lose yourself back. What was the first... With, so you'd say she, she said she said would, would be like the first... No, I... That, that I have some connected with the influential drugs. No, not really. There's nothing can pinpoint because I mean, like Robosol was pot, right. or the one before was the, was the white drawing. I, I don't remember. It was like, you know, like pills influenced in Hamburg, <laughs> you know, and drink influenced this in so and so. And I don't know. There's no specific things. I only wrote because the guy said, "I know what it's like to be dead." I thought that was, if I'd read it in the paper, I would have written a song about it. And to write a mood song, if I'm sad, I would just write sort of sad things. It, you know, just remember something when I was a boy, everything was right and all that, which was a dream. But, you know, I would put myself in a sad mood and write a sad song. Um, or be in a sad mood and write a song is more like it. The, from, from, uh, just to go to movies like Hard Day's Night. Yeah. What do you think when you saw Hard Day's Night? Well, uh, thought it wasn't bad, it could have been better. You see, there's another illusion that, the, <laughs> that we were just puppets and that, what, that these great people like Brian Epstein and Dick Lester created this situation and made this whole fucking thing be precisely because we, what, we were what we were and realistic. We didn't want to make a fucking shitty pop movie. We didn't even want to make a movie that was going to be bad. And we insisted on having a real writer to write it. And Brian came up with Alan Owen from Liverpool, who'd written a play for TV called No Trams to Lime Street, which I knew, and I think Paul, maybe no they all knew. No Trams to Lime Street. Lime Street's a famous street in Liverpool where the Hoos used to be in the old days. And he was famous for writing Liverpool dialogue. And they hinted, um, we, like, auditioned people to write for us, you know. And they came up with this guy, and we knew, we knew his work. And we said, all right, but then he had to come round with us to see what he was like. But we'd, he was a phony, you know. He was one of, like a professional Liverpool man, you know, like professional Americans like that. And he stayed with us two days and wrote the whole thing based on our characters. And that, me, witty, Ringo, dumb, cute, George, this. And I set the whole thing. And we were a bit infuriated by the glibness of it, you know, and the, the shittiness of the dialogue, you know. And we were always trying to get it more realistic, even with Dick and all that, and make the camera work more realistic, but they wouldn't have it, you know. But they made that movie, and so that's how it happened, and the next one was just bullshit. Well, like Hard Day's Night, now. I just hate this illusion about George Martin, Brian Epstein, uh, Dick Lester, and all these people making something out of us. We're the ones that are still creating. My impression from the movie was that... Uh, and that was the one of, it was you, it wasn't anybody else. It was, it was a good projection of one facade of us, which was on tour in, once in London and once in Dublin, of us in, in that situation together, in a hotel, having to perform before people. We were like that, he saw the press conferences and we were a little, he recreated it pretty well, but we thought it was phony then even, you know, it wasn't realistic enough. Were you aware of the impact that Hard Day's Night had in the States, I mean, other than being tremendously popular? I don't remember. All we knew was big hit or no hit, you know, mm -hmm. if, if it was a big hit or not. I don't remember. This is the, the Hard Day's Night was sort of the period when, everybody, when the birds started. Was it? Well, all the musicians, all the American musicians. Oh, I, American I don't American know. Say they went and saw Hard Day's Night and realized rock and roll was okay. I see, I see. No, I wasn't ever aware of those impacts. I was aware of musical impacts, more listening to be, oh, no, he got that from us, and we got that from us, all that kind of thing. But I, oh, I don't know, I can just tell where the groups came from. You know, any of them now, I can tell. You know, like Zeppelin and Fleetwood Mac, you can hear all this, where everything came from. Same as you can with anybody, you know. So, at, anyway, after a hard... When did you first... Are we still on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um... There, there, I, I remember the single coming out, uh, Day Tripper, We Can Work It Out. Yeah. And, uh, somewhere that was a drug song. <laughs> day Tripper. Why? Because it was a day tripper, you know. I just liked the word. Um, at, at, at some point, right in there between sort of help and hard day's night, you know, sort of got into drugs and got into doing drugs. No, but in hard day's night, we were, I was on... Pills, that's drugs, you know, that's bigger right. drugs than pot. I, I've been on pills since I was 15, or si no, since I was 17. 
since I became a musician, the only way to survive in Hamburg, to play eight hours a night, was to take pills. Like the waiters gave you the pills and drink. I was a fucking drop-down drunk in art school. I was a, a pill addict until help, were, just before help, where we were turned on to pot and we dropped drink. Simple as that. I've always needed a drug to survive. I can't, you know, and the others too, but I always had more, you know. I always took more pills and more of everything because I'm more crazy. I think that when you first started writing message songs, serious songs. Probably after Dylan, I don't know. Day Tripper wasn't a serious message no, song. No, no. I don't mean I don't mean a serious message song in that sense. I mean there was a big change in your music from from uh, you know the can't find any love to we can work it out. What was on the back side of that? Band? You can't do that. Yeah, that was till what? To what? Two rubber so to to starting to I suppose it was pot then, you know. I don't really know, you know. I can't even we can work it out was I Paul wrote that chorus, you know, I wrote the middle bit of that. Life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting, all that bit. But I don't remember any changeover, other than when you take pot, you're a little more, less aggressive than when you take alcohol. See, when, you, when you're alcohol and, and uh, pills, you just, you know, it's just cocoon about anything, you know. Well, all right, then that's to say, talking about Rubber Soul, Rubber Soul was it. Was that, do you, can you tell me if that white album with the drawing by Klaus Vormann on it. There's an album. Was that before Rubber Soul or after? Oh, I see. Okay, Rubber Soul is the one. You yeah. really don't remember which? No. Um. Well, maybe the others do, you know. I don't remember those kind of things because it doesn't mean anything. It's all gone. Well, Rubber Soul was like a, uh, it seemed like the first attempt at was serious. No, we, we just we're, we're getting better technically and mu musically, that's all. I mean, we finally took over the studio. I mean, in the early days, we had to take what we were given, you know, and we had to make it in two hours or whatever it was, and one, three takes was enough, and, and we didn't know about you can get more bass and do it. We, learnt, we, we were learning the technique, and rubber soul, we were sort of more precise about making the album, right? that's all, and we took over the cover and everything, you know. What well, was Rubber Soul? That was just a simple play on that. Oh, that was Paul's title. It's like Year Blues, I suppose, you know. Main meaning English soul, you know. <coughs> rubber Soul, I suppose. Just a pun. Nothing, there's, see, there's no great mysterious <laughs> meanings behind all of this. It was just four boys, you know, <laughs> working out what to call a new album. I don't mind. No, we better go on because Yoko's got your pal Jonathan Cott to do the same trip with next, how she formed the Beatles in 1929. <laughs> and we like to be together because it's nicer. What happened to Why? I'm saying the, the psychological stuff for later. Um, oh, I think. <laughs> go on. Uh, what did uh, Derek, uh, Derek uh, and Brian have? Uh, why did they fall? Where did they what? They had a good fight. Oh, because um, Derek is another egomaniac, you know, who, who, and Brian was very hard to live with, you know, to take. He had a lot of tantrums and things like that. Uh, like most fags do, you know, they're very insecure. You know. And uh, I think it just, something happened, which I don't remember, maybe Paul or somebody, but you'd have to ask them, you know. But uh, something happened. Some, they had many arguments, and Derek would walk up because he was too proud to do cer certain jobs. And that. That's the same now, you know. And uh, don't blame him, but don't get paid for it. <laughs> so that's what happened. They had a big row. And uh, Derek was hired by Brian, so was Peter Brown. You know. They really were not hired by us. The yes, all those. We hired Neil in Liverpool and Mal in Liverpool. Those are the only people we ever hired. The Hunter Davies book has one. It was bullshit, yeah. The Hunter Davies book? Well, it was really bullshit. You know, it was written in the sort of Sunday Times, you know, the Fab Four, and, and no truth was written. And my auntie knocked all the truth bits about my childhood and my mother out, and I allowed her, which is my cop out, etc., etc. There was nothing about the orgies and the shit that happened on tour and all that and I wanted a real book to come out but we all had wives and didn't want to hurt the feelings end of that one because they still have um, you know I mean the Beatles tours were were like satirical <laughs> you know I mean th we had that image but 
man, our tours were like something else. If you could get on our tours, you were in, you know. They were satirical and all that. Yeah, Australia. What? <laughs> just everywhere. It's satirical. Just think of satirical only with four musicians going through it. But you go to a town, a hotel. Wherever we went, there was always a whole scene going. We had our four bedrooms separate from, tried to keep them out of our room, and Derek and Neil's rooms were always full of junk and whores and fuck knows what and policemen and everything. Satirical, you know. We really, well, we had to do something. And what do you do? The pill doesn't wear off when, you, when it's time to go. You just go. I used to be up all night with Derek, whether there was anybody there or not, you know, I just couldn't ever sleep. Such a heavy scene it was. Like anybody, like they're all into now, but they didn't call them groupies then, they called it something else. But we, we, if you couldn't get groupies, we'd have whores and everything, whatever, whatever was going, you know. Who would arrange for all that stuff? Derek and Neil, that was their job. And Mal, but <laughs> I'm not going into all that. Business on the convention. Oh, sure it was. I mean, when we hit town, we, we hit it, you know. We're not pissing about. But, you know, there's photographs of me. God knows they're crawling about in Amsterdam on my knees, coming out of whole houses and things like that, and people saying, good morning, John, and all that. And the, the police escorting me to the places and things like that. <laughs> you know, because they never wanted the, a big scandal, you see. I don't really want to talk about it, because it hurt Yoko, you know. <laughs> And it's not fair, but suffice to say, just put it like, you know, they were satirical and on <laughs> tour, and that's it. Because I don't want to hurt the other people's girls either. It's just not fair. I'm but sorry. Yes, yes, I was surprised, you know, I didn't know things like that. I thought, well, John is an artist, and probably he had... How did artists live? Two, two or three affairs, you know, before getting married, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the concept you have in an old school New York art, artist group, you know, that kind of... The generation gap. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> oh. George is so patty by the time. I don't think so. I don't think they have, you know, you'd have to ask them and say, look. Let me ask you about something else that was yeah. said 100 days ago. At one point, I said you and Brian went off to Spain. Yeah. Did you, you must have. We didn't have an affair. Kind of no, not, not an affair. <laughs> <laughs> what was, what, what, what is that? See, from, from Brian. I, Sim was having a baby, and the holiday was planned. But I wasn't going to break the holiday for a baby, you know. That's how, what a bastard I was. And I just went on holiday, you know. And I watched Brian with picking up the boys, you know. Brian. I liked playing a bit faggy, you know, and all that. But <laughs> I was, it was enjoyable. With those big rooms in Liverpool, it was terrible. Like Very what? embarrassing. And you and Brian. Oh, fuck knows. <laughs> Yes, yes. I was pretty close to Brian because if somebody's going to manage me, I want to know them, you know, inside out. And the, the period when he told me he was a fag and all that, I, I introduced him to pills, you know, which gives me a, a guilt association for his death. I mean, they go that way anyway. And uh, to make him talk, you know, to find out what he's like. And he, I remember him saying, don't ever throw it back in my face, I'm a fag, which I didn't. But his, his mother's still hiding that. You know. But what I hate is the way they're all attacking Alan. And Brian was a nice guy, but he, he, he knew what he was doing. He robbed us, you know. He fucking took all the money and looked after himself and his family, you know, and all that. And it's just a myth. I hate the way that Alan is attacked and Brian is made like an angel just because he's dead. He wasn't, you know. He was just a, a guy. I'm going to go berserk when he hears all this. <laughs> Won't he? Do you think so? I think he yeah. What else was left out of 180 books? Well, that, I don't know. I can't remember it. Uh, Love Me Do was a better book by Michael Brown on the Beatles. Right. That was a true book. You know, he wrote How We Were, which was bastards. You can't be anything else in a situation of such mm -hmm. pressurised. And we took it out on people like Neil, Derek and, and Mal. Mm -hmm. And that's why, underneath the facade, they resent us, but they can never show it, you know, and, and they, won't, they won't believe it when they read it, if it's in print, etc. But they, had, they took a lot of shit from us because we were in such a shitty position, you know. It was hard work, and somebody had to take it. Um, Those things are left out, you know, about what bastards we were. With, you know, I mean, fucking big bastards, that's what the Beatles were. <laughs> 
Yeah, you have to be a it. bastard to make it, man, and that's a fact. And the Beatles are the biggest bastards on earth. Like Alan's Christmas card says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil because I'm the biggest bastard in the valley or something. <laughs> well, yeah, there's no kidding. If you make it, you're a bastard, you know. But how did you manage to keep that clean image? It's amazing. It's because everybody wants the image to carry on. The press around with you want to carry on because they want the free drinks and the free whores and the fun. Everybody wants to keep on the bandwagon. It's satirical. Oh, and we were the Caesar. Shoo. No one's going to knock us when there's a million pounds to be made. All the the handouts, the bribery of the police, all the fucking hype, you know. Everybody wanted in, you know. Everybody that's that's why some some of them are still trying to cling on to this. Mm -hmm. Don't don't take it away from us, you know. Don't take Rome from us. Mm -hmm. Not a portable Rome. <laughs> that's true. Where we all have our houses and our cars and our lovers and our wives and office girls and parties and drink and drugs. Don't take it from us. You know, or otherwise you're mad. John, you're crazy, you know, silly John wants to take all this away. What do you say to, <laughs> do you say to Beatle people today? When, what do you mean, like Beatle fans? Yeah. If they, I don't, it depends who they are, you know, I mean, come on. Yeah, if they say, uh, what, you know, ask me something about hard day night health, I just straight with them, say, oh, it was good fun, and, and, or it was like this, because, I mean, I, I'm giving you the dirt, I mean, there's, a lot of it was great fun, you know. Um, I don't know. I don't meet any Beatle people, do I? No. I don't know where they are. You know. In fact, I don't really know how to answer that. There's apple scrubs or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what they are, Beatle people or not. I don't know. By Beatle people, I, it, it's something I like to get back to. It's really worth saying. Over. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I'd like one of you fucking underground people to point it out, you know. Let it bleed. <laughs> Satanic Majesties is, is, uh, is pepper. We love them, man. It's the most, you know, fucking bullshit. That's all you need is love, you know. They, they didn't... Uh, I resent the implication that the Stones are like revolutionaries and that the Beatles weren't, you know. If the Stones were or are, the Beatles really were. Uh, they're not in the same class, uh, music-wise, or power-wise. Never were, and Mick always resented it. But I never said anything. I always admired them because I liked the funky music and I liked their style. You know, I always regretted cutting my hair, you know, a bit like that. You like rock and roll. Yeah, I like rock and roll, and I like the direction they took after they got over trying to imitate us. You know, but uh, he's even going to do Apple now. He's going to do the same thing and spend. If he if if it happens, he'll he'll do exactly what we did and be lose all his money, you know. But I, he said some. Just, he's obviously so upset by how big the Beatles are compared with him, and he never got over it. That he's now in his old age, he's beginning to knock us, you know. And he keeps knocking because now the Beatles have, like everybody, jumped in on the bandwagon to knock Beatles when we split, and from Apple. Uh, the Apple facade, uh, you know, that whatever was going on those days, that everybody's been knocking us, you know, and I resent it because uh, even his first, second fucking record, we wrote for him, <laughs> you know. And Peace Made Money and all that. Which? Oh, he sent Peace Made Money. Yeah, we didn't make any money from no, Peace, you know. And you, what, Sergeant Peppers came out, you, know, you must, and you knew, when, when you finished with Sergeant Peppers, and, or, uh, you know, started to put together the next set of songs, I mean, you know, then you knew at that point that this is a great album. Sergeant Peppers. Did you feel that while you were making it? Yeah, yeah. And Robert Solo, too. And Revolver. What did you... Yeah. What did you think when you, what, what did you think of the, the review in the New York Times on Sgt. Pepper? I don't remember it, you know. Did it panic? Yeah. I don't remember. Those days reviews weren't that important right. because we had it made whatever happened. Nowadays I'm sensitive as shit, <laughs> you know, and every review counts, you know. Mm -hmm. But those days, we were too big to touch, you know. So I don't remember re the reviews at all. I never read them. And though we were so blasey, we never even read the news clippings. I didn't bother with them or read anything about us. It was a bore to read about us. Maybe Brian told us or somebody told us about it that it was great or lousy. I don't even remember ever hearing about it. That was the first sort of real anti beatles thing in the States. Yeah. Well, they have been. They've been trying to knock us down since we began, including the British press, always saying, you know, the big joke in crowd with us was, what are you going to do when the bubble bursts? And we told them, you know, uh, privately, <laughs> and then etc. That we'd go when we decided, not when some fickle public decided, you know, because we're not a manufactured group. Mm -hmm. That we are what we are because we know what we're doing. But of course, we made many mistakes and etc. etc. But we knew instinctively that it would end when we decided, not when when the ATV decides to take off our series, anything like that. There was very few things that happened to Beatles that weren't really well thought out by us whether to do it or not. And, you know, what what reaction and would it last forever? We had an instinct for it, like somebody wrote. Yeah. Um, what did you do? Could I have a pepper, please? Yes, pepper. Yeah. Would you like three, please, then? Yeah. When you, you, we were talking about the tour and all, you know, the tours and terrified and so on, and everybody was going on, and then somehow the protection stopped that you had. Like George, there's a story about George being at the party at which Nick and Keith were busted. But they let George out. I don't believe it. He wasn't there. I never, I, uh, I don't think he was there. Oh, I, I think he, it wasn't that they let him out. We were never protected like that. Only on the tours we were protected because everybody was paid off. But uh, 
then I think if he, I vaguely remember that George had left you know there was a myth around that we were protected by the MBE I don't know whether it was true because I still had it when they got me had I when they busted me yes you did yeah but I think uh, it's a sort of psycho see there's a sort of there's two ways of thinking that they're out to get us or it just happened that way you know as a sort of I think it more or less that after I started Two Virgins and doing those kind of things it was like well it seemed like I was fair game for the police you know and uh I don't know, I really don't know, you know, there was some myth about us being protected because we had MBE, I don't think it was true, it's just that we never did anything, I mean, the way Paul said the acid thing, I mean, he got a, you know, he did a sort of, I don't know, he never got attacked for it, you know, I don't, I don't know whether that was protection, because it was sort of openly admitting that we had drugs. I don't really know about that. I don't think we were ever protected in in England. I just think nobody really bothered about us, you know. I think George probably left that party hours before or the day before or something. But you'd have to ask him. Yeah. Look, I think uh, Bobby, you have to rest. Yes, she's gone. Why can't you be alone with that young girl? I can be, but I don't wish to be, you know. Somehow, I remember in Los Angeles, when, I was, when, we, were, when we came down to L.A. Yeah. that time, and, uh, uh, and you went to the kitchen to get something, so I followed, yeah. and we stood there. I, I mean, I felt very nervous. You know, I felt that you were very nervous, too. Well, it wouldn't be because I wasn't without your girl. I'd just, you know, I, I, I'd be the same. Just nervous for what I was nervous, you know. Probably in the middle of that therapy, I was wide busted, wide open, you know. I wasn't used to it at all. But I can be alone without you. Know, I just have no wish to be here. There's no reason on earth why I should be alone. There's nothing more important than our relationship. Nothing. And we dig being together all the time. You know? And it, it, both of us could survive apart. But what for? No. I'm not going to sacrifice love, real love, for any fucking whore or any friend or any business. Because in the end, you're alone at night. And I, neither of us want to be. And it's, you can't fill the bed with groupies. It doesn't work. And I, I don't want to be a swinger. You know. Because it doesn't, I've, I've, like I said in the song, I've been through it all. And nothing works better than to have somebody you love hold you. What, um, the act, there was a while in which you, you know, hid out in Weybridge and just sat around at home all the time. Yeah. And did that. Well, that's what they say, but I made some, I wrote a lot of songs and made some, what would be termed far out tapes, you know, which I still have, and made a lot of movies on 8 mil. But at the time, I used to think that that was not doing anything, you see. I thought if I wasn't doing sort of Beatle work, this isn't work. You said at one point you have to write songs that can justify your... Well, I've said a lot of things. You know. I write songs because that's the thing I chose to do, you know. And uh, I can't help writing them. That's the fact. And sometimes I feel as though you work to just... I felt as though you work to justify your existence, but you don't. You work to exist. And... That's it, really. What do you think of your art? I don't know how you mean. What? In what terms? You say you write songs because you can't help it. Yeah, I mean, creating is a result of pain, too. I have to put it somewhere. And I write songs, you know. But that hiding in Wadebridge, I used to think I wasn't working, but I'm, I made <laughs> 20 or 30 movies, or, you know, on just 8 mil stuff, but they're still movies. And many, many hours of tape, of different sounds, you know, just not rocking, just, so, suppose, would call them avant-garde, I suppose. That's how Yoko met. I, I'd play, I mean, there was very few people I could play those tapes to, and I played them to, and then we made Two Virgins. The, the, a few hours later. What did um, Cynthia publish in that book? I don't remember, you know. 
Uh, at the time I was making two virgins, she was away on holiday. Both our respective spouses were on holiday when when we got together. You know. And uh, that was it. I don't know. I didn't communicate with her. Either. What happened to Tony Palmer's father? Uh, well, we stopped it, really. Because it... I don't want to misquote it because he'll sort of get upset, but it was just bullshit. So we we made a mistake doing it. We take on too much, that's the problem. How are you going to avoid going overboard on things again? Yeah, I think I'm a, I'll be able to control myself. And not, not in the... Not control is the wrong word, but... Uh, I just won't get involved in too many things, that's all. Yeah. I think, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'll just do whatever happens. There's more, you know, it's... It's silly to feel guilty that I'm not working, I'm not doing this, it's, uh, you know, I have to, it's just stupid. I'm just going to do what I want for myself. You know? I mean, for both of us. What did, um, what happened to Magic Alex? I don't know, he's still in London. No. Did, did you all really think that he had these uh, inventions? I think some of his stuff actually has come true. I'll check it with Alan, but they never, they just haven't manufactured. Maybe one of the whole myths, you know, is a saleable object. He was just another guy, you know, that comes and goes like, around people like us, you know. You say he's... He's all right, but he's cracked, you know. He doesn't mean... He means well. You say in the, you say in the record that freaks on the phone won't leave me alone. Yeah. Don't give me that brother, brother. Yeah. Um, because I'm sick of all these aggressive hippies or whatever they are, you know, the now generation, uh, sort of being very uptight with me, you know just either on the street or anywhere on the phone or demanding my attention as if I owe them something, you know. I'm not their fucking parents, you know. That's what it is. You know? uh, they come to the door with a fucking peace symbol and expect to just sort of march around the house or something, like an old Beatle fan. They're under a delusion of awareness by having long hair. And that's what I'm sick of. I'm sick of them. They frighten me, you know. There's a lot of uptight maniacs going around wearing fucking peace symbols. What did you think of the Manson when that thing happened? Uh, I don't know what I thought when it happened. I just think a lot of the things he says are, are true. Mm -hmm. uh, that he's a child of the state, pr made by us. Right. And uh, he took their children in yeah. when nobody else would, is what he did. But uh, of course he's, <coughs> he's, he's cracked, all right. But he's, he would, he uh, went, what was your feelings when you say, well, he was a helter skelter? Well, he's balmy. He's like any other Beatle kind of fan who reads mysticism into it. I mean, we used to have a laugh putting this, that, or the other in, in a light-hearted way that people, some intellectual would read as some symbolic youth generation. Mm -hmm. What's it? But we also took seriously some part of the role, you know. But... Uh, I mean, I don't know, what's Helter Skelter got to do with knife in somebody? You know, what, I don't even, I've never listened to the words properly of Helter Skelter, it was just a, sort of a noise, you know. Everybody was talking, everybody uh, spoke about the uh, back, playing backwards things on Abbey Road. And well, that's bullshit. I just read one about Dylan, too, that if you, that he sings no tin and it meets, I don't believe it, it's bullshit. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I know, but it, it start, it'll start it all off. Was it no, you? Right, no, it's just because that's the end of it. You know, I know the end of it. Were there any of the... <laughs> on the ru rumor about Paul being dead? That's, well, we've been through all this one before, haven't we? About the rumor? About Paul being dead? I don't know where that started. That was balmy, you know. Why? 
I don't know where it, it, it was. I don't know. You know as much about it as me. Were any of those things that on the album that they said were on the album? Which name a few? Just the clues or no? That was bullshit. The whole thing was made up. No real church put that out. No, not we never put anything like that. We put like tit 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 in girl, and uh, just I don't remember. You know, it would be things like a, a beat missing or something like that. See if anybody noticed. Some think more things like that. You know, I don't remember any. I know we used to have a few things, but nothing that could be interpreted like that. Why do you think something like that? Room like this? that whole death thing would happen. Because yeah, people have got nothing better to do than study Bibles and make myths about it and study, you know, rocks and make stories about how people used to live and all that. You know, it's just something to do for them. They live vicariously. John Lennon, The Rolling Stone Interview, Part 4. There's a point, there's a point in, which, in which you decided that you'd give up your private life and then you uncle would give up your private life. No, we never decided to give up our private life, but we decided if we're going to do anything like get married or like this film that we're going to make now, that we would dedicate it to peace and the cons concept of peace. And during that period, because we are what we are, it evolved that somehow we ended up being responsible to produce peace, you know. I mean, even in our own heads we would get that way. But uh, that's, how it, that's how it is, you know. But peace it is uh, still important, you know. And, but my life is dedicated to living, <laughs> just, ex you know, surviving is what, what it's about, really, from day to day. And we don't want to be hypocrites, you know, like uh, most people start to destroy their own private life and just become uh, like a big billboard saying peace, you know, or something. But we want to sort of uh, try to be a human as well, you know, so try to hold on to our life as well. When you look back on, um, like, going to Amsterdam... That was beautiful. It's like the wedding album, you know. And it was a move for peace, you know. I mean, it's... No question about it. What do you think the effects of that were? I don't know. You see, I can't measure it, you know. We don't know. You have to tell us. You tell us. You're, you're reacting. We're acting, you know. Somebody else has to tell us what, what, what the reaction is. What happened in Denmark? In the... In the... In the During that time, what do you think? Well, we sat there discussing it, you know, and... Uh, that part of it. I mean, the... Uh, there's the doctor... Hammer it. Hamrick was brought over by Tony because he said this to this great doctor. He didn't, hadn't mentioned about the flying saucers until he was on his way almost. Mm -hmm. But uh, that this guy was going to hypnotize us and we would stop smoking. We thought that was so we thought, great. Practical. So uh, Tony said it really worked because it worked on us. And it had worked. Tony and Melinda did not smoke. And he said it was easy. So he was brought over and this sort of guy comes in who seemed to be primaling all the time. You know, mm -hmm. He was always crying and that. And uh, talking, and then he tried it, and it didn't work. You know, I mean, when <laughs> tell me only the sick, he talked like crackers. So I mean, that's what. And then, then he said things like, "Well, he put us back into our past lives, and we're game for anything then." You know, so I mean, it's like going to a fortune teller. So we said, "Oh, I'd do it." And he was mumbling, pretending to hypnotize us, and we're lying. Then he's making up all these Walt Disney stories about past lives, you know, which we didn't believe. But he was such a nice guy in a way that we didn't want to sort of say, "Well." We were sort of saying, well, it seems a bit strange, just, I don't know. And I was more into it than Yoko. I mean, she's not quite as silly as I am. But I was thinking, well, you never know, do you? You know, I, I had this thing that believe anything, everything until it's disproved, you know. And it turned from giving up Siggy's, into, and he went going on about he'd been on a spaceship. But watching, you know, I would say, well, well come on, tell but us you more. Were a bit suspicious, too. Oh, it's suspicious, <laughs> sure I was, you know. But I wouldn't stop the stories coming out and tell us how it was, you know. And then he'd be saying how, you know, they all think that there was this harbinger. I didn't know about it, but I heard that Tony and them had been there. Tony had only gone at the end, you know. But they were obviously all insane people, you know. And uh, then these other two came over. I don't know what, they, one in purple and the other magician, the picture of him. He said he was going to put spells on everybody and all that. It was just really crazy, and we were getting worried then, by then, you know, that uh, it was getting out of hand. 
But we wondered why this Hamarik, if he was such a higher being, and all of them think that they're, they're higher beings. I mean, they're still traveling around Europe and everywhere thinking they've got messages, you know. And it's a shame. <laughs> and uh, Hamarik said he'd been on a flying saucer, but we all suspected it was some, somebody so spiritual and ethnic or whatever the shit. Why is he so fat? Why can't he, you know, get that together? That was the thing. And he'd say, well, because... Um, uh, I have to get myself in a certain state of being by eating all these, these ice cream buns to, to communicate with the Martians, you know. And the poor old dear and his wife are probably up in Canada now. Could I just say something? Yes, that you may. Uh, no, no, this is something else that Dan says, yeah. that he checked the suit, you know, that we're supposed to move into. Oh, yeah. He says, Navarro is better. So if you want to move into Nav Navarro... Navarro? We've been there once. I know. But even Navarro is better if you want to move from Wigan. He said Hilton is going to be open next week. Why is it worse? Why are you going to tell Alan that? Okay, I might do that. We'll, you don't have to, but it would be an idea. I'd, we can get on to that after. I'll stay in the Regency then. I'd like to get, you know, finish it. So come on. Yeah. Um, oh, Jesus. Ugh. But actually, we went there to talk to to see Kyoko, you know, and it was another case of sort of you know brothers and all that. So, you know. um, love me, love my dog. Do you said he said that before again. You said uh, that talking is bad for communication. Music, when did I say that? I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not. You know, it's true one minute, what not we, true the next. What is it? What do you think the future is going to hold? Whatever we make it. Why is it? Why? Is I mean, if we can, if we want to go bullshitting off into intellectualism with rock and roll, we're going to get bullshitting rock intellectualism. If we want real rock and roll, we'll, 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 it's up to all of us to create it and stop being hyped by, you know, revolutionary image and long hair. That We've got to get over that bit, you know. That's what cutting the hair is about, you know. Let's own up now and see who's who and who's doing something about what and who's making music and who's laying down bullshit. It, rock and roll will be whatever we make it. Why do you think it means so much? Rock and roll? Because it's... Uh, primitive enough and it has no bullshit really the best stuff and it gets through to you it's beat you know I mean go to the jungle and they have the rhythm and it goes throughout the world and it's as simple as that you get the rhythm going everybody gets into it and it's uh, I think Ma Ma Michael X as he said it but I read the Eldridge Deaver somebody said it that rock, uh, the blacks gave the whites the middle class whites back their bodies you know put their minds and bodies to it it's something like that you know it, it gets through it. To me, it got through. It was the only thing that, it, to, to get through to me out of all the things that were happening when I was 15, you know. Rock and roll meant was real. Everything else was unreal. And the thing about rock and roll, good rock and roll, whatever good means, etc., all that shit, is that it's real, you know. Mm. And realism gets through to you, despite yourself. You recognize something in it which is true. Like all true art. What is it? Whatever art is, mm. readers. Okay? You know, it's that. If it's real, it's simple, usually. And if it's simple, it's true. Something like that. Mm. Yes. Rock and roll got through to you, didn't yes, it? Yes, it finally. I was just going to say that, you know, classic music was 4-4, four, four, basically 4-4, four, four, you know. And then it went into 4-3-2, which is a waltz, you know, rhythm and all that. But it just went further and further away from the heartbeat. Heartbeat is 4-4, four, four, and it goes 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, you know. Right now. And then they started 1, 2, 3, you know, all that. And then Perversion. their rhythm be became very decorative. And then, you know, like Weyburn, Schoenberg, Weyburn, all their rhythm is like, da -dum, da -da -da -da, you know, like that. But the point is, it's highly complicated and interesting, and our minds are very, you know, much like that. But they lost the heartbeat, you know. And I went to... Mm, see uh, the Beatles session, you know, and in the beginning I was saying, oh, well, you know, and so I was saying to John, well, why do you always use that beat all the time, the same beat, you know? 
Why don't you do a bit more fun and complex, you know, coming from the That's why I was doing music. Bulldog. Uh, yeah, and uh, he was saying, oh, she's saying uh, we're using the same beetle all the time or something. I went very embarrassing. And then I suddenly realized that's what... For, for me, because if somebody starts <laughs> laying that intellectual on me, I, I'm, I'm going to think, oh, maybe... He's a very shy I, film. I'm shy. Yeah. You know, if somebody attacks, I, I, re, I, I shrink mm. until I've got... Ah, this is an intellectual snob, really. Yeah. She's well, an intellectual, well, supreme intellectual, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> so I'm, I really know what I'm talking about when I Wait say those you know, fucking intellectuals, that, you, know. you know. I know <laughs> what they... They have to go through the... They have to have a, a sort of, like... Like a maths formula, a thought pattern in their head to feel something. They can't just, you can't just go, they have to go sort of, this is the result of that which did this, you know, because of the programming them when they were children. Well, the best way to explain is, mm. I can't play the piano unless I see a score. Which I is insanity. Right. So that is that? intellectualism. You know, <laughs> and that is musicianship. You know, that's the, the school of music shit. Yeah. To be able to not to make music unless you can read a piece of paper which has nothing to do with music. Yeah. And you feel the same, you know, the same way about rock and roll now that at thirty. Yeah. You did when you were fifteen. Well, and it'll never be as new. You know, I mean, it's never going to do what it did to me then. But uh, like tutti frutti. And Long Tall Sally is pretty avant-garde. I met an old avant-garde friend of Yoko's in the village the other day who was talking about one note and didn't Dylan sing one note. And, you know, like he's just discovered that. But, you know, that's about as far out as you can get, you know. And so I, I'm, even intellectually, I can play games enough to, to, for reasons why that music is very important and always will be. Like the blues, as opposed to uh, um, jazz, you know, white, middle class, good jazz, as opposed to the blues, you know. Uh, the blues is better. Because it's simpler? Because it's real, you know, it's like, it's not perverted or, man or thought about in a, con it's not a concept, it is an actual it's a chair, not a design for a chair, or a better chair, or a bigger chair, or a chair with leather or with, with uh, design. It is the first chair, you know, it's chairs for mm -hmm. sitting on, yes. not chairs for looking at or being uh, appreciated. You know, you sit on that music. What, what, how, would you, how would you describe Beatle music? Uh, Beatle music. Well, it means a lot of things to me. You know, there's not one thing that's Beatle music, because how can I? I'm part of it. Some, you know, what is Beatle music? Uh, Walrus or Penny Lane? Which? Or, I mean, it's that diverse. Or I Want to Hold Your Hand or Revolution Number 9. Well, what, what was it? What do you think it was about, like, Love Me Do? Love Me Do was rock and roll, you know, pretty funk, funky. What do you think? What I mean? What do you? I just. What do you? What do you think accounted for the sudden popularity of Love Me Do? Love Me Do was never big. It might have made it over here after we'd made it. Remember that America followed right. much after because we were local heroes. Love Me Do didn't only make number forty in the charts mm -hmm. in England. It didn't do anything, you know. And uh, it was just. But I mean, what was it about the sound that that not to really Love Me Do, but anything that caught everybody? Because uh, we didn't sound like everybody else, that's all. I mean, we didn't sound like the black musicians because we weren't black, and et cetera, et cetera, and because we'd, we w were brought up on a different kind of music and atmosphere. And so, uh, Please Please Me and From Me To You and all those were our version of the chair. You know, we were building our own chairs, that's all, you know, and they were sort of local chairs. That's, I don't know. What were the first devices and tricks that you used that, uh, the first embellish. gimmick w was the was the harmonica there'd been a few there'd been hey baby mm -hmm. and uh, there was a terrible thing called I remember you in England by some I remember you type of harmonica and I'd played a lot of harmonica mouth organ really was when I was a child so uh, 
we did those numbers, and so we started using it on Love Me Do, you know. And just for arrangements, because we used to work out arrangements, and we just used it, you know. And then we stuck it on Please Please Me, and then uh, we then we stuck it on From Me To You, like that, you know, it went on and on, it got into a gimmick, and then we dropped it, it got embarrassing, you know. What, what were the other, what sort of complexity embellishments besides harmonica did you start with? Well, we didn't. We we did that at the cabin. I was playing harmonica, but uh, that was the gimmick in the early days. Was the harmonica? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you mean uh, musically on the records. What what did we do? The first sort of tricks was double tracking on the second album. We discovered that, or it was told to us, you can do this, and that really set the ball rolling. We literally double tracked ourselves off the album in, on in the second album. That really, apart from the, the first lot, we just did as as a group that we went in and played, and they they put it on tape, and we went, you know, and they 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 remixed it, they did everything to it. I'd love to remix some of the early stuff, you know, because it's better than it sounds. And I want to cover some John. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> She's gonna do Lena McCartney album. <laughs> But you've got to do your old. You've got many. You've got so many albums. Have you, you ever thought of there's there's a live album and there's some uh, Hollywood Bowl? It yeah. was pretty tatty, you know. It's nice when to hear. It'll probably go out one day, I thought. But we're so nervous, you know. Well, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but why not, you know? Uh, the Hollywood Bowl was just. It's always, like, you know, it was always like Dean Martin was in the audience and all all the children. It wasn't like people anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. Like that, and we were always nervous. It was like going on the Palladium, but it, we're, it's, we're there, all right. You know, there's also Shea Stadium somewhere. But there's one in Italy, apparently, that somebody recorded there. But he always did everything twenty times faster than normal. You know. What do you think of those concerts like Hollywood Bowl? Like doing that? It was awful. I hated it. Some of them were good. Some weren't. The I didn't like Hollywood Bowl because I don't know whether we, if we knew we were being recorded, it was death, you know, it was so frightened, and because you, you knew there was, there was always terror when your voice was always, you could never hear yourself, and, uh, you know, you knew that they were fucking it up on the tape anyway, and there was no bass, and they never recorded the drums, you could never hear them, the sound, the places were built for fucking orchestras, not groups, you know, and uh, it just wasn't, some of those big gigs were good, but not many of them. Yeah. In, uh, in re- rereading that interview with, that you did with John Cobb a year or so ago, you said something about uh, uh, Ticket to Ride. Yeah. Being a favorite song. Yeah, I liked it because it was the, it was slightly a new sound at the time. Because it was pretty fucking heavy for then. If you go and look in the charts or what else, or, or what other people, music people make it, and you hear it now, it doesn't sound too bad. It's one of them. So it doesn't make heavy. you cringe. Uh, if it, if I if you give me the eight track and I'll remix it, mm-hmm. I'll show you what it is really. But you can hear it there. It's I used to like guitars, you know. <laughs> I don't want anything else on the album with guitars and jangling piano or whatever. And it's all happening. That's a it's a heavy record, you know. And the drums are heavy too. It, it's that's why I like it. Yeah. Um, on the in I am the Walrus, that's a, a yeah. That was the B side of Hello Goodbye. Can you believe it? He said, "You uh, say in the um, in Glass Onion, here's another clue for you all." The Walrus is Paul. Well, I said this to oh, Ray Connolly asked me. At that time, still in my love cloud with Yoko, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll just say something nice to Paul that it's all right, you know, and, uh, you know, you you did a good job over these few years holding us together, and, and you know, he was trying to, to organize the group and that, you know, and do the music and be an individual artist and all that. So I wanted to say something to him, you know. And I did it for that reason, you know. I thought, well, you can have it, you know. I've got Yoko, and thank you. You can have the credit, you know. And 
I decided uh, I'm sick of between reading things about Paul is the musician and George is the philosopher I'm, I wonder where I fit in you know what 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 was my contribution I'm, I get hurt you know I'm sick of it so I, I'm, I'd sooner be like Zapper and say listen you fuckers this is what I did you know and uh, I don't care whether you like my attitude saying it, but that's what I am, you know. I'm a fucking artist, man, and I'm not a fucking PR agent or the product of some other person's imagination, whether you're the public or whatever, you know. I'm standing by my work, whereas before I would not stand by it. You know? So that's what I'm saying. I was the walrus, whatever that means. I only saw, we saw the movie in L.A. and the walrus was a big capitalist that ate all the fucking oysters. <laughs> if you must know, that's what it was. I always had this image of the walrus and the it was all, you know, I loved it and that. And so I didn't, I never check what the walrus was. I'm going out to hand the walrus, you know, as if it's something, but he's a fucking bastard. <laughs> that's what it turns out to be. But, I mean, the way it's written, everybody presumes that it means something, you know. I mean, even I did, so. I mean, we all just presume, just because I said I am the walrus, that it must mean I am God or something. But it's, it was just poetry, you know. But it became symbolic with me. What, um, what other uh, things are there like that? The walrus, so I don't know. Uh, I said hello to Peter Brown in Ballad of John and Yoko because you know, sort of, it's just a way of thanking them because you know? right. I learned things from Yoko in a way they always dedicate their work these are on God people to each other you know, like this is f for David Tudor and this is for that and they're grateful for the original the whole book's dedicated to all these men and I wouldn't let her put it in the real one but now I understand it a bit better I thought they were all sort of no it wasn't well, anything special I know I know but they I always you know they, they, it says, you know, uh, like, say, say it was, um, like, I've dedicated the album to Yoko, but they dedicate, like, uh, you know, isolation for George, or isolation for, for, for Jan, you know, just because you were around when we spoke or something like that. It's nice, you know, they did that to each other. And uh, so it's a bit like that, you know. Was, With a drop of a hat they did, you know. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I understand, he understands, tour, don't worry. You know, <laughs> they were just in the group, and they yeah. did a lot of that, so I, I just sort of picked up on it, I suppose. And I'm very, uh, you know, f sort of full. full of uh, you know, I, I like, I want people to love me. You want people, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be loved. What did you think of Abbey Road? Uh, I liked uh, the A side. I never liked that sort of, <laughs> whatever, pop opera on the other side. Yeah. I think it's junk. It was one of the most sort of fragmented things. Yeah, because it was just bits of song thrown together, you know, and uh, I, I can't remember what's on there. It said, Come Together is all I remember, and something's on it. Yeah, yeah that was my song. You know. So that's all I remember. What, did I do anything else on Abbey Road? Come Together? And one? Don't tell me. I couldn't be an album with just one track on No, no, no. Anyway, I, I, um, it was a competent album, like Rubber Soul, in a way, you know what I mean? It was... Uh, together in that way, but it uh, it had no life really. Well, uh, how did you compose "Come Together"? How did that? Uh, oh, I can't say this for being sued. You see, <laughs> see, Rosemary, uh, this is different. They want Rosemary. The Learys wanted me to write. This is not the suing bit. The Learys wanted me to write them a, a, a campaign song, and their slogan was "Come Together." And, uh, and you do, right? I wrote it, I've still got it. It's actually very like the Kinks drive, you know, some song of those. But anyway, I wrote Come Together. But before I wrote their song, uh, I was writing in the office, just sort of... I can't say this because we're going we're to get sued because it's silly. But I was writing this, um, like, you can't catch me, you know, the same rhythm and using the old words. I often do it, you know, like... Mm -hmm. I'm, if I'm trying to write one light, long, tall Sally, or I'm just singing, I'm going... Oh, well, let's do a dummy fit. No, go on and tell one Mary and just make up, change, paradise the words. I was doing that, and then when I got, I stopped and then said, just came out, come together, because come together was rolling around in my head. Right now, over me, and over me was meant to be like a joke, like, over me, like Elvis used to, over you. But people arrived in London saying, you said, come together over me, and I'm here. <laughs> you know, and I thought, oh, well, um, 
So that was like that. And then I never put the other, the other one went. Come together and join the party. Come together and join the party. You know, for Leary, might give Peter a chance, chant along thing. Leary doesn't know, but we should send that. Yeah, I know, but it's so, I never get around to it. So I never did it and I ended up writing Come Together instead. And, and they're suing me be, because it's like you can't catch me, you know, for the first half a line or something. Because Chuck Berry's words went something like that, you know. But anyway, it's not him that's suing me, it's his people. So you have to not put that in because they'll say, oh, well, there's, he's admitted it, you know. Yes. And I think it's a compliment to Chuck Berry, not a fucking... <laughs> mm. I mean, we resurrected him. On the instant, instant yeah. karma is like a, uh, uh, the changes of volume is love. Well, there's many songs that are similar. It's, because I, I, I'm full of... I always like to say where the source was. I say, well, that was from, from You Can't Catch Me. But if I never said anything, nobody would ever know. Just one guy spotted it. But there's many songs in the same chain. The chorus isn't the same. The only thing is it goes, down, 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 down. But many of them do. It's like millions of songs go, down, 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 down. All those, uh, you know, whiter shades of pales and uh, just thousands of songs. What was it like doing Instant Karma? Recording it. It was great, you know, because I wrote it in the morning on the piano, like I've said many times, and I went to the office and I, I sang it, I thought, hell, let's do it, and we got, booked the studio, and Phil came in, he said, how do you want it? I said, you know, uh, 1950, but now, he said, right, and boom, I, I did it, and about three goes or something, and went in, and he, and he played it back, and there it was, you know. And the uh, only argument, I said, a bit more bass, that's all, and off we went, you know. See, Phil's a real, he's great at that. He doesn't fuss about with, you know, fucking stereo or you know all the bullshit you know it's just does it sound all right let's have it. it doesn't matter whether something's prominent or not prominent if it sound if it sounds good to you as a layman or as a human take it don't bother whether this is like that or um you know the quality of this just take it and that suits me fine yeah we're just finishing Can I give you, could I have you for a minute? yeah in there yeah you come in too. have we finished yeah, but I, I, I'd still like to know more, but we can take a break. I'd like okay. to call Manny and have a moment. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to, really. You know, because nobody's done it. I don't want to start all that pictures of John and Yoko, but just yeah. to take one with an instamatic, you can take it, and you can take it. That would be terrible. I just it won't be terrible. Look at the album. The well, look, take it. Don't be a snob. Don't I mean, be professional. Just take a photo. Um... <laughs> right back. Yeah. When did you first uh, become aware of, uh, of the idea of stereo, of being able to work with stereo? Uh, oh, sometime or other, I don't know. Let <laughs> me think. Uh, well, I don't know, there was a period where we started realizing that you could go and remix it yourself, you know, and we'd li start listening to them or, or saying, well, why can you do that? You know, we'd be just standing by the board saying, Oh, well, what about that? And George Martin said, well, how do you like this? You know, in the early days, they just would present us with finished product. We'd say, what happened to the, uh, the bass or something? They'd say, oh, well, that's how it is, you know, you, can, you know, that kind of thing. And then, so it, it must have been a gradual thing, like... Uh, Was Robert Soul the first album really control uh, I think so, yes, you know, full control. Yeah. Well, we'd take control in as much that we'd say, you know, this is what I want, you know, online, and it should be like that, and et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, I mean, if it sounds like it, that's when it happened. I mean, there's an obvious difference in the... Um. Uh, on that. Give Pete a chance, what do you think of that? As a record, I thought it was beautiful. Did you, did you ever see the uh, 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 more touring day in Washington? Oh yeah, I mean that's what it was for, you know. Did you see that soon? I, 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 I think I heard it. I don't know. I just remember hearing them all singing. I don't know whether it was on the radio, or TV, you know. But I mean, that was a very big moment for me. You know, that's what the song was about. You know, I wanted to, you see, because. 
because I'm shy and aggressive, you know. So I have great hopes for what I do, my work, and I also have great despair that it's all pointless and it's shit. And you know, uh, how can you top Beethoven or watch Shakespeare or whatever? You know, I go through all that. And in my secret heart, I, w- I wanted to write something that would take over. We shall overcome, you know. I don't know why. That's the one they always sang. I thought, why isn't somebody write, writing one for the people now? You know, that's what my job is. Our job is to write for the people now, you know. So the, th- the songs that they go and sing on their buses even. And not just love songs. I had the same kind of hope for working class hero, you know. But I know it's a different concept, but I feel as though it's, it's like... Uh, I think it's a revolutionary song. In it's it's really just revolutionary, you know. I just think its concept is revolutionary and I, I hope it's for workers and not for tarts and fags. You know. I hope it's about what Give Peace a Chance was about, you know. But I don't know, you know. On the other hand, it might just be ignored, you see. You work. I think it's for the for the people like me who are working class, whatever the uh, upper or lower, who who are supposed to be processed into into the middle classes, you know, or into into doc, into in, through the machinery. That's all. This is it's it's my experience. And I hope it's just a warning to to people. Working class hero. Yeah. Oh, that's a fantastic. No, but don't, I don't want praise. I just I'm saying it. It's a. I think it's a revolutionary song. You know, not the song yeah, itself. It's, it's a song for the revolution. Mm-hmm. You if you have a, uh, a, a, a feeling, can, can you put deliberately put out a commercial record? I mean, can you you have a feeling for a number one record? No. See, I keep thinking Mother is a commercial record. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Because all the time I was writing it, it was the one that was singing the most. It's the one that seemed to catch on in my head. I'm convinced that Mother's a commercial record. But I agree. You agree? Well, thank you. But you said God. No, I didn't. No, no, well, they're, they're all playing God. Oh, isolation, Chief. But if you start saying isolation, well, that's it. Well, maybe. No, but, but, yeah. but you're right about Mother because uh, it's the one that I have in my head all the time. Yeah, right. Trust your insight. Put that out. Yeah, but it's, well, it's, there's politics in it, too. But politics is what politics. politics will prepare the ground for pe- for for my album. The same as "Old oh, My Sweet Lord" prepared the ground for George's. Mm. I need. I'm not uh, somebody. I'm not going to get hits just like that. People aren't going to buy my album just because Rolling Stone liked it, mm-hmm. or because they're going to play it tonight because Pete's a good pusher. You know, people have got to have got to be hyped in a way. To or got to they've got to have it presented to them in all all the best ways possible. You know. And if love can, because I like the song love, you know, I think it's a, it, it's a, 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 I like the melody and the words and everything. I think it's beautiful, you know. But I'm more of a rocker, that's all. I, I originally con- conceived of mother and love as being a single, you know. But now that I think mother's, you know, but I don't want to. I want to put one out with her. Then I have to get rid of one, you know. But I think love is. I I, th- I agree with him. You know, love will do me more good. I don't think so. I I think say trust your instinct. Of his part of well, I wasn't the instinct, and also the thing is, mother. That's I mean, that's what it is. What stays in your head the longest? I mean, what will stay in your head the longest? No, but if you haven't heard, if you no, no, but if you don't, if you only hear, if you hear love more, that will stay in your head more. I mean, love love is also commercial. I've heard, I've heard it all the same number of times, and Mother is the one that's still I always have in mind. Yeah, I understand that, but uh, taking if you don't take them all at once and you just take love, it's a it's a it's a single song, it's a single record. Mother is a single, love's a single. God could be, so could isolation and remember. And I mean, I you know, I write singles. I don't write, <laughs> I write them all the same way, you know. But mother, you've got to take into account the lyrics too. If I can capture more sales by singing about love than singing about my mother's and crying, you know, I'll do it. Because that would open 
a door for. I I'm opening a door for John Lennon, you know, not for for music or for the Beatles or for a movement or anything. That's a good. I'm yes. I'm presenting myself to as broad a scope as I can, and I'm I'm talking out what I think as a result of them saying this to me. You know, there's also many little side lines like uh, this is not for publication. Like Capital are trying to say that this isn't Plastic Ono record. You know, oh, but love that has nothing to do with love actually. Oh, they're trying to now say that this is John Lennon, one of the Beatles, and therefore it's a different deal, you see. When, it, when they thought I was not, you know, when they were on the McCartney bandwagon, which they were on, and they thought that I was just an idiot pissing about with the Japanese broad and, and the music we were making, like Toronto, they didn't want to put out because they didn't like that, and all that, they were content to let me be a plastic on a band and give me a release on it, a special release I have to get, because the Beatles are tied up. As Beatles, you know, or as individual performers. The implications? the implications are that money, all of it's money, man. And they're all just, they're being hypocrite. Now they're saying, well, you know, it looks like this is a John Lennon album, not Plastic Ono. Well, to me, it's Plastic Ono, you know. Or I wouldn't put it out like that. So that's another reason to put us out together like that. It's, there's, all, there's all those things. But I'm going to think about love, you know. You see, the original idea was there wasn't, there's not enough things on the album to put out a single, you know, because there's only ten songs, really, nine if you don't count Mummy. And uh, that means that there's nothing to buy then, you know. But to me, it sounds like there's 40 songs on it, you know. It just mm. sounds... Very heavy. But they, there are the, there's that side of the market. I'm not going to disregard it, you know. Just I'm in to sell as many albums as I can, you know and as many records as I possibly can because I'm an artist who wants everybody to love me and everybody to buy my stuff, you know. And I'll go for that, you know, without selling out anymore, you know. Um, just, just, I've got to come back to that. Do that, do that. Uh, yes, you were. The theory of putting out something that's commercial yes. to get people to buy the album, of course, is that obviously yes. no great shakes about that theory. It's to counterbalance. Which is most commercial? Yeah, but it's to, but in which, the no 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 but which how 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 quick do you get to number one? The thing is, love will attract more people because of the message, man. There's many many people who are not like mother. They don't. It hurts them. The first thing that happens to you when you get the album is you can't take it. Everybody's reacted exactly the same. They think fuck, you know. That's why everybody is on the second time. They can just they start saying, oh well, there's a little. You know, so if I lay mother on him, it confirms the suspicions that something nasty is going on with that John Lennon and his broad again. You know, to the just the, see, people aren't that hip. There aren't, you know, students aren't that aware and all that bullshit. They're just like everybody else. They, oh, what misery! You know, is that what it's? Oh, don't tell me I'm, it is really awful. Why is, he why is his mother? Why you know, be a good boy now, John. Or, or that you, you know, you had a hard time, but me, me and my mother, you know. So there's all that to go through. Love is, is I wrote it in, in a spirit of love. In all that shit, I wrote it in a spirit of love. It's, it's for Yoko. It has all that connotation for me. And it's a beautiful melody. And I'm not even known for writing melody. There's all that angle. Mm. Also, people would hear it, and they'd hear all this shit about what, a, what the shit that's going on. And it's banned, and he wrote, and it's all, he doesn't believe in God, and were the Kennedys, and my God, what did he, you know, all that. That I'm going to get that, you know. This will sort of say, well, you know, in amongst that, you know, in in life there is that, you know. There's that too. You know. I'm very good. <laughs> I've really convinced myself that. But it's true. Though. It's you know, true. Though. You can't think of that. You know. For everything, you know. I mean, oh, yes, but I'll still consider it. Mother, people think I it's too It'll do personal. me good, you know. If, if, I, if it goes, it'll do me good. Go on. Um, did you write uh, uh, most of the stuff in the album on guitar? The ones where I play guitar, I wrote them on guitar. The ones where I play piano, I wrote on piano. What do you, what do you think of the difference between the guitar song? Uh, well, let's think of the difference between... I found out and remember something. Or I f there's not there's more piano ones on this one than guitar, isn't there? I think. Um, what are the differences to you when you write them? Uh, 
because I can play piano even worse than I play guitar. So that's a limited uh, palette, as they call it, you know. And so I surprise myself, you know. I mean, I, I have to think in terms of oh, go go from C to A, you know, like that. And uh, I'm not quite sure where I am half the time. And 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 when I'm holding the chord, I go ding. And it might only be an ordinary on the guitar. It's just a, it's only a sixth or a seventh or something like that. On the piano, I don't know what it is, you know. I know it's a, I mean, it's not, but it's something like that. So it's it's that kind of feel about it, you know. But with the guitar, I, I know such a lot about the guitar, you know, that um, that I'll, with guitar I can be busking, or if I just, I don't know, you know, or if I want to write a, a sort of just a rocker, I have to play guitar because I can't play piano well enough to inspire me to rock, you know. It's like that. That's the difference, really. What? What, are, what, what do you think are your best songs? Ever. 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 What is the best song? The one best song. Have you thought of that? Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's like somebody asked me what's my favorite song. You know, like, is it Stardust or something like that? I can't. It's that kind of decision making. I can't make. I like. Uh, I always like Walrus, Strawberry Fields, Help, In My Life. Those are some favourites, you know. Why? Why help? Because I meant it. It's real. It's a. It's. It's a. The lyric is as good now as it was then. It's no different, you know. And it makes me feel secure to know that I was that sensible or whatever, you know. That not sensible, but aware of myself. Then that's when, with no acid, no nothing, you know. That's. I mean, well, pot or whatever. That doesn't mean a thing, really. You know? It was just me singing help, and I meant it, you know. Um. I don't like the recording that much. The song I like, you know. We did it too fast to try and be commercial and all that. You know. There's some song I like. I want to hold your hand, you know. We wrote that. Together. It's a beautiful melody. I, I, I might do. I want to hold your hand and help again, you know. Because uh, I like them. I sing them, you know. The kind of songs I sing. <laughs> Why strawberry field? Can't be that real. Because it's real, yeah. You know. I mean, it was real for then, and and it's. It's, uh, I think, I, it was, it's like talking, you know. I sometimes think no, but I, then again, I mean, I said, you know, like that. You see, it's, it's like that Elton John one where he's, he's singing, um, oh, I don't know, he talks to himself sort of singing, which I thought was nice, you know. It reminded me of that. Sounds like Girl. Um, I, yeah, I like that one. Life. Girl, uh, Run For My Life, I always hated, you know. I don't know. Because it was one of them I knocked off just to write a song, you know, and it was phony. But girl's real. Uh, there's no such thing as the girl. She was a dream, you know. But the words are all right, you know. It's about what well, she taught when she was young that pain would lead to pleasure. Did you understand it? All that. The, this sort of philosophy quotes was was reasonable. I was thinking about it, you know, when I wrote it. It wasn't just a song. Uh, and it was about, you know that girl that uh, happened to turn out to be Yoko in the end, but the one that a lot of us were looking for, you know. There's many songs I forget like that, you know, that I do like, but... Mm, I like Across the Universe, too. Why? Because uh, it's one of the best lyrics I've written, you know. In fact, it could be the best, I don't know. You know? I mean, it's one of the, the best. You know? it, it's... Good poetry, you know, or whatever you call it. What? Without without tune, it it stands. Without a song, without see the ones I like are ones that stand as words, you know, without melody. They don't have to have any melody. You know. It's a poem, you know. You could read them. That's your ultimate criterion. No, it's just the ones I happen to like. You know, I like it when it when I like to read other people's lyrics too. You know. What what? So what happened with Let It Be? Well, it was another one like Magical Mystery Tour that. Uh, well, so to, I don't, you know, this is. Uh, it's hard to say. I, in a nutshell, Paul wanted to. Make, it was time for another Beatle movie or something. He wanted us to go on the road or do something, you know. And as usual, George, I'm going, oh, we don't want to do it, fucking all that. And he sort of set it up, and uh, there was all discussions about where to go and all of that. And uh, I would just tag along, and I had Yoko by then. I didn't even give a shit about nothing, you know, and I was stoned all the time, too, on age, etc., and, uh, 
I just didn't give a shit, you know, and nobody did, you know. And you know, it's like in the movie when I go to do across the universe, Paul yawns, you know, and and plays boogie, and I immediately say, "Oh, does anybody want to do a fast one?" You know, that's how I am, you know. So that year after year, that begins to wear you down. How long does that session last? Oh, fucking. God knows how long. Paul had this idea that we were going to rehearse first. He always, he's more like Simon and Garfunkel, you know, like looking for perfection all the time. And uh, so he has these ideas that we'll rehearse and then make the album, you know. And of course, we're lazy fuckers, and we've been playing for 20 years, for fuck's sake. We're grown men, we're not going to sit around rehearsing, you know. And I'm not, anyway. And we couldn't get into it. You know. And we put down a few tracks, and nobody was in it at all. It just, I don't know. It was just a, a dreadful, dreadful feeling in Twickenham Studio and being filmed all the time, you know, like that. I just wanted them to go away and we'd be there at 8 in the morning and you couldn't make music at 8 in the morning or 10 or whatever it was in a strange place with people filming you and coloured lights, you know. Just say, how did it end? So the tape ended up like the bootleg version. We let Glyn Johns remix it. You know, we didn't want to know, we just left it to him and said, here, do it. It's the first time since... The first album, we didn't have anything to do it. We just said, do it. You know, Glyn Johns did it. None of us could be bothered going in. Nepal, nobody called anybody about it, and the, the the tapes were left there. And we got an acetate each, and and we called each other and said, well, what do you think? Oh, let it out. We were going to let it out with that, with a really shitty condition. You know, disgusted. And I I wanted. I didn't care. I thought it was good to go out to show people what had happened to us. You know, like this is where we're at now. We couldn't. Get, we can't get it together. We we don't play together anymore. You know. Leave us alone, <laughs> and uh, but and Glyn Johns did a terrible job on it, you know, because he's got no idea, etc. Never mind, you know, but he hasn't really. <laughs> and so he the the bootleg version is what it was like, and and you know, Paul was probably thinking, well, I'm not going to fucking work on it. There was 29 hours of tape. It was like a movie, you know. I mean, just so much tape. Ten, 20 takes of everything because we're rehearsing and taking everything you know <clears throat> nobody could face looking at it so when Spectre came around it was like you know well alright if you want to work with, uh, with us you know go and do your audition man do do and it was he worked like a pig on it you know? I mean it was he'd always wanted to work with the Beatles and he was given the shittiest load of, you know, badly recorded shit that, and with a lousy feeling to it, ever. And he made something out of it. It wasn't fantastic, but it was, you know, when I heard it, I didn't puke. I thought, oh, you know, I was so relieved after hearing six months of this, like, black cloud hanging over that this was going to go out, you know. I thought it would be good to go out, the, the shitty version, because it would break the Beatles, you know, it would break the myth, you know. Look, that's what we're... That's us with no trousers on and no glossy paint over the cover and no, you know, sort of hype. This is what we're like with our trousers off, so, you know, would, would you please end the game now? But that didn't happen and Paul wouldn't... Well, we're not wouldn't. We ended up doing Abbey Road quickly and putting out something slick to preserve the myth. Why? To preserve the myth. <laughs> Well, no, 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 it's not like that. But if it's suggested, I will go along. I'm, I'm, I'm weak as well as strong, you know. And um, I wasn't going to fight for let it be, because I really couldn't stand it, you know. But there was um, finally when let it be was going to be released. Paul at that point wanted to release his album. Well, oh, yeah, I don't. Well, I don't quite, you know. It's so many clashes, you know. Uh, it's, it did come out at the same time or something, didn't it? Yeah. I think he wanted to show he was the Beatles, you know. By bringing out McCartney? I think so, you know. Were you surprised when you heard it, at what he had done? Yeah, I was surprised it was so poor, you know. What did you expect, a full scale? Well, not a full scale. I expected just a little more, you know. I mean, cause, because if Paul and I are sort of disagreeing, and I feel weak, I think he must feel strong, you know, that's in an argument. Oh, not that we've had a much f physical argument, you know, or mental one of talking, but you expect <coughs> the opposition so-called. So I was just surprised, you know, and uh, I was glad too, you know. So, oh, <laughs> you know I, was, I thought, yeah, I, you know, 
I suddenly got it all in perspective, you know. What do you, what do you think Paul was thinking of Alvin? I think, uh, I think it'll probably scare him, you know, into doing something decent. <laughs> and then he'll scare me into doing something decent and I'll scare him like that. I don't think, uh, I think he's capable of great work, you know. I think he'll, he will do it. I don't wish he wouldn't, you know. I wish nobody would, Dylan or anybody, you know. I mean, in my heart of hearts, I wish I was the only one in the world, you know, or whatever it is. But uh, I can't see him doing it twice. What was it like to go on tour and, and, and uh, I read this is something very cool, uh, and people, and cripples coming up to you? Well, well, I mean, that's what, that was our version of what was happening. It, it got that, uh, you know, people were sort of touching us as we walked past, that kind of thing, and wherever we went, we were supposed to be not sort of like normal, you know, whatever. We were supposed to put up with all sorts of shit from Lord Mayors and their wives and be touched and poured like Hard Day's Night only a million more times. You know? Like at the uh, American Embassy, the British Embassy in, in Washington here, or wherever it was with some for the animal cut Ringo's hair, you know, in the middle of... I walked out of that, you know, swearing on all of them, and I just left in the middle of it. But uh, I've forgotten, you, you tripped me off onto that. What was it? What was the question? The cripples. Oh, yeah. And uh, wherever we went on tour, like in Britain or wherever we went, there's always a few seats laid aside for uh, cripples and people in wheelchairs like that. But it got to that because we were famous, we were supposed to have people, sort of epileptics and, you know, whatever they are, in our dressing room all the time, you know. We're supposed to be sort of good, you know. And, uh, and it's just... Was, a, you wanted to be alone, and you don't know what to say, you know. I mean, because they usually say... I got your record, or they can't speak or something, and, and they just want to touch you. And it's always their mother or their nurse pushing them on you. They, they, they would just say hello and go away. But there's this sort of like they push them at you like you're Christ or something, or as if you there's some aura about you which will rub off on them, you know. And it just got to be like that. We got very sort of callous about it, you know. It was just dreadful. You know? I mean, you'd open up every night instead of seeing kids there, you just see a row full of cripples on the front, you know, all just sort of. It was just like that when we, when we were running through, there'd be, the people would be lying. In, it seemed like just surrounded by cripples and blind people all the time. And when, when we'd go through corridors, everybody would be, they'd be all touching us. You know, it got like that. It got horrifying. You must have been like, still fairly young and naive at that point. Yeah. Well, I mean, as naive as in his own right, you know, and which is... Uh, uh, surely that must have you know, made you think for a second about what? No, I mean, we knew what the game was. You know, the game is the same... I mean, it didn't the... astound you at that point to see that you were supposed to be able to... Well, it, that, we were, that was a glib way of saying what was going on. It was that sort of the in-joke that we were supposed to cure them, you know, is the kind of thing that Derek would say, because it's, it's a cruel thing to say. I mean, we felt sorry for them, like anybody would, you know, and it was awful, but there's a kind of embarrassment when you're surrounded by sort of blind, deaf and crippled people and there's only so much we could say, you know, with the pressure on us to do, to perform and things like that. But it just built up, it built up, the bigger we got, the more unreality we had to face, you know, and the, the more we were expected to do until when you didn't sort of shake hands with the mayor's wife, she starts abusing you and screaming or saying, how dare they? And, and there's a, one of Derek's stories or where... We were asleep after the session, you know, in the hotel somewhere in America, and this, the, the mayor's wife comes and says, you know, get them up. I want to meet them, you know. And Derek said, I'm not going to wake them up. And she starts saying, you get them up or I'll tell the press. And it was always that. They were always threatening what they would tell the press about us, you know, the bad publicity if we didn't see their bloody daughter and, and with their braces on her teeth and... It was always the, the, the police chief's daughter and the Lord Mayor's daughter, all the most obnoxious kids because they got the most obnoxious parents, you know. We were forced to see all the time. And we had the, these people thrust on us, you know. 
And that was the most humiliating experiences were all those for me, like sitting with the governor of the Bahamas because we're making help and being insulted by these fucking jumped up middle class bitches and bastards who would be commenting on our working classness, you know, and our manners. And I was always drunk like the, the, the typical whatever it is, insulting them. I couldn't take it. I was, it hurt me, so I would go insane, swearing at them and whatever. I'd always do something, you know, that would... I couldn't take it. It was awful, you know. And all that business was awful, you know. It was a fucking humiliation. We had to... We had to... One has to completely humiliate oneself to be what the Beatles were. And that's what I resent, you know. I mean, I did it, but I didn't know. I didn't foresee that... You know, it just ha happened bit by bit, and you gradually, till this complete craziness is surrounding you, and you're doing exactly what you don't want to do with people you can't stand, the people that you hated when you were ten. And that's what I'm saying in this album. I'm saying, I remember what it's all about now, you fuckers. You know, fuck you all. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You know, fuck you all. You know, you don't get me twice. Will you take it all back? What? If I could be a fucking fisherman, I would. You know, if I had the capabilities of being something other than I am, I would. It's no fun being an artist, you know. It, it isn't, you know what it's like writing. It isn't fun. It's, it's torture. You know, and all the, I read about Van Gogh or Beethoven, any of the fuckers, you know. And I read an article the other day, well, if they'd had psychiatrists, we wouldn't have had, uh, you know, Gauguin's great pictures, you know, and these fucking bastards, you know. They're just sucking us to death. Uh, that's all, but all we can do is do it like fucking circus animals. I resent being an artist in that respect. I resent performing for fucking idiots who, won't know, who don't know anything. They can't feel. I'm the one that's feeling because I'm the one expressing what they are trying to... They, they, re, they live vicariously through me and other artists. And we are the ones that, like, even, even with the boxers, <laughs> they, when Ringo come in the ring, Oscar comes in the ring, they're booing the shit out of him. He only hit Clay once, they're all cheering him, you know. That's what I resent. You know, I'd sooner be in the audience, really, but I'm not capable of it. You know, one, one of my big things is I, want, I wish I was a fucking fisherman. I know it sounds silly, and I'd sooner be rich than poor and all the rest of that shit. But the pain, I'd sooner not be... I wish I was... Ignorance is bliss or something, you know. If you don't know, man, there's no pain. Oh, well, probably there is, but that's how, you know, that's how I express it. It's shit. What do you think the effect of the Beatles was on the history of Britain? I don't know about on the history. I mean, the people are in, in control and in power and the class system and the whole bullshit bourgeois scene is exactly the same, except that there's a lot of fag fucking middle class kids with long long hair walking around London in trendy clothes and Kenneth Tynan's making a fortune out of the word fuck but apart from that nothing happened but we all dressed up the same bastards are in control the same people are running everything it's exactly the same they they hyped the the kids and the generate there's been a we've grown up a little all of us and there has been a change and we are a bit freer and all that but it's the same game nothing's really changed you know it's the same history of Britain. Shit, they're doing exactly the same thing, selling arms to South Africa, killing blacks on the street. People are living in fucking poverty with fucking rats crawling over them. It's the same, you know. It just makes you puke, and I woke up to that too, you know. That dream is over. It's just the same. Only I'm 30, and a lot of people have got long hair, that's all. Why are you... <laughs> Very heavy, isn't it? I mean, that's what it is, man. Nothing happened except for we grew up, you know. We, we did our thing just like they were telling us, well, well, you kids, you know, it's exactly the same. Most, most of the so-called now generation are getting in, in a job and all that. Nothing changed. We're a minority, you know. We're, we're a minority. like People like us always were. But we're a, maybe we're a slightly larger minority because of something or other. And what I respect about John's music is, it's like, you know, it's very real. You know how pe people tell children about Santa Claus and all that, you know? And, you know, when you start not to believe in Santa Claus and all that shit. But the thing is, you know, like George Harrison, that the only thing that I object is that he's still saying Santa Claus is there, you know, all that But that, shit. He, that's not an... But he's just saying... But that's a, a, a question of age or whatever, you know, or, or the his... 
he can't. He believes it. You know, there's yeah, n- it's, it's not. That, it, that it's that not a conscious choice. Right. He's twenty five or something. You know, but it's, it's just that you know that the fact is. Yeah, but it's not good. Know, don't compare that, it with George. Oh, you know? okay, I, mean, I won't compare it with George. But it's we're, just we're not that talking that about that anyway. We're talking about social <laughs> revolution in England. What? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't like. I don't want this. Comp- it's hard not to compare with George, even for us. But I don't want to be compared with George. You know, why should I be compared with George? You're right. You know, my music has nothing to do with George's. Why do you think you have, Why do you think the impact of the Beatles so much bigger in America than it was in? The same as American stars are so much bigger in England, I suppose. I don't know, because it's grass is greener, and we we really were professional by the time we got here. We learned the whole game, you know. When we arrived here, we knew how to handle press. The, the British press are the toughest in the world. We could handle anything. We we were all right. I know on the plane over, I was thinking, oh, we won't make it. Oh, I said it on a film somewhere, you know. But that's the side. That's that side. Of, we knew we would wipe it, wipe them out if we could just get a grip on you, you know. So, so you, we were new, and we didn't look. I mean, when we got here, all you were all walking around in fucking Bermuda shorts with Boston crew cuts, and and uh, you know, stuff on your teeth. And now they're telling us that they're all saying, "Well, uh, Beatles are passe, and this is like that." And mm. you know, and um, the chicks looked like fucking 1940s horse horses. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there was no conception of dress or any of that jazz. You know. I mean, we just thought, what an ugly race. What an ugly race with, with you know, it looked just disgusting. You know? And we thought how hip we were, you know. But, of course, we weren't. It was just the, the, the five of us, you know, us and Mick, you know, were, were really the hip ones or something. The rest of England is just the same as it ever was. But you tend to get nationalistic. We, were, we used to really laugh at America, you know, except for its music. And it was the black music we dug. You know, and over here, even the blacks were laughing at people like, uh, Chuck Berry and and the the blues singers, the blacks thought it was wasn't sharp to dig the really funky black music, and the whites only listened to Jan and Dean and all that. And you know, I mean, we felt like we were we had the message was uh, listen to this music. You know, I mean, it was the same in Liverpool. We felt very exclusive and underground in Liverpool, listening to Richie Barrett and and uh, Barrett Strong and all those old-time records that nobody was listening to anywhere except for Eric Burden in Newcastle and Mick Jagger in London. It was that lonely, you know. We, it was fantastic. And we came over here and it was the same. You know, nobody was listening to rock and roll or to black music in America. And we felt as though we were... You know, we thought we were coming to the land of, uh, of its origin, but nobody wanted to know about it. Why did you make revolution? Which one? Oh. Three of them. There's three. Uh, Starting the single. The single. When George and Paul and all them were on holiday, I made Revolution, which is on the LP, and Revolution Number no. Nine. I wanted to put it out as a single, but they said it wasn't good enough. They came home. I had it all prepared, and okay. they came back and said it wasn't good enough. And we put out what? Hello, goodbye, or some shit. I don't know. No, we put Hey Jude. Sorry, which was worth it. But we could have could have had both. You know. Mm. I wanted to put out what I felt about Revolution. I thought it was about time we fucking spoke about it. The same as. I thought it was about time we stopped not answering about the Vietnamese war on tour with Brian, you know, when we had to tell him we're going to talk about the war this time, we're not going to just waffle. Mm. And I wanted to say what I thought about revolution. I'd been thinking about it up in the hills in India, and I still had this, you know, God will save us feeling about it, you know, it's going to be all right. But even now I'm saying, hold on, John, it's going to be all right, otherwise I won't hold on, you know. But uh, that's why I did it, you know. I wanted to talk. I wanted to say my piece about revolution, you know. I wanted to tell you or whoever listens and communicate and say, what What do you say? You know, this is what I say. And that's what I said. And on one version, I said, in uh, <laughs> if you well, about violence in or out, because I wa- I'm not, I wasn't sure. But the version we put out said, count me out. I think because I, I don't fancy a, a violent revolution happening all over. I don't want to die, you know. But I, I begin to think that well, what else can happen, you know? I mean, it seems inevitable. Combined revolution? Yeah, and the revolution number nine was a was an unconscious picture of what what it's what I actually think will happen when it happens. You know? That was just a, like a, a drawing of of revolution, you know. So I was hoping what because arbitrarily 
I was making all the thing was made with loops. I had about thirty loops going and fed them onto one basic track. And one loop there, I just got, I was getting like Beethoven and that from upstairs and chopping it up and making it backwards and things like that to get sound effects. And one thing was an engineer's test thing, and they come on talking. I said, "This is EMI test series number nine, you know, like that." So I just cut off whatever he said. And I had number nine, and nine is. I know it turned out to be my birthday and my lucky number and everything, but I didn't realise it. it was just so funny. The voice went number nine. So it was like a joke, you know, bringing number nine in all the time. That's all it was. It turns out to be that highest number among, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, it's, the, it's all, many symbolic things about it, but it just happened, you know, that it was an engineer's tape, and I was just using every, all the, the bits, like to make a montage, you know, but uh, I, w I really wanted that out, you know, but never mind. So that's how I feel, and I know uh, the Chairman Mao bit, I always feel a bit strange about, you know, because I thought that if they, they're going to get hurt, you know. I, my, the idea was don't aggravate the pig by waving the, the thing that aggravated the red flag in his face, you know. I really thought that, you know, uh, that love would save us all, you know. But now I'm wearing a Chairman Mao badge, so that's where it's at, you know. I'm not. I'm, I just beginning to think he's doing a good job, you know. John Lennon, The Rolling Stone Interview, Part 5. Who do you think is good? Yeah. In any art. You see, the unfortunate thing about egomaniacs mm -hmm. is they don't take much attention of other people's work. I only assess people on whether they're a danger to my work or not. Yoko... <laughs> is more as important to me as Paul and Dylan roll into one. Her work is... I, I don't think the four batters will get recognition until she's dead. You know, and there's me and maybe... I could count the people on one hand that can have any conception of what she is or what her mind's like or what her work means to this fucking idiotic fucking generation. And I just... She has the hope that she might be recognised, but... I, Next year. The, if I can't get recognized, I'm, I'm doing it in fucking clown's costume, man. I'm doing it on the streets, you know. I don't know what... I admire Yoko's work. I admire Andy Warhol. I, I admire Zapra Bit, but I think he's a fucking intellectual. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of anybody else. I admire people from the past, you know. I admire Fellini. Uh... I don't know, a few that Yoko's into. She's educating me into, into things that I didn't know about before, you know, that just because of the scene I was in. So I'm, I'm getting to know some other great work that's been going on in the past and now. There's, pe there's all sorts going on, you know. And, uh, but I still love Little Richard. And I love Jerry Lee Lewis, you know. I mean, they, they, they like primitive painters, you know. I'm getting into it because now she's, she's teaching me. Yeah, right. So we're both yeah. showing each other's experience, you know, to each other. And it's, it's like you say when, when you play Yoko's music or something. I had the same thing. I had to open up to hear it. I had to get out the concept of what I wanted to hear and what was to allow abstract art or music in. She had to do the same for rock and roll. It was an intellectual exercise because we're all boxed in. Mm. We're all in little boxes, you know, and we we have to have somebody has to come in and go, <laughs> you know, and rip your fucking head open for you to 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 allow something else in, you know. Mm. I let a drug that do it, you know, like mm. it'll bash your head open, and you think, fucking hell, mm. you know, or some artists can do it, or they, but they usually have to be dead two hundred years to do it. You know, I mean, all I ever learned in art school was about fucking Van Gogh and stuff. They didn't teach me anything about. But anybody that was alive now, or they didn't, they never taught me about Marcel Duchamp, which mm. is, uh, which I despise them for, you know, and Yoko's taught me about Duchamp and what he did, which is just out of this, fantastic, you know, he Amazing. got a fucking bike wheel and said, this is art, you cunts, 
You know, he wasn't Dally. Dally's, Dally's all right, but he's like Mick, you know. Oh, so you heard about Dally in school? Dally, no, no, but I mean, if you put the thing back into that age, Dally's like Mick and Duchamp yes, is yes, like yes, me yes, or yes, you, yes, you know. Yes. And I love Dally, but the fucking Duchamp was spot on, you know. Why were not? Because, because, because... Uh, he's creating the same impact. He just, a he's mm, great, original, you know, yes, he's an original, original great, and he's, he's in so much pain, you know, and, and, mm. but he's got his fame, he's got his own cinema and all that, and I don't dig all that uh, junky fag scene and all that that he lives in, or whatever, I don't know whether he lives like that or what, I dig Heinz soup can, mm, yes, man, there's, that was something, mm, that wasn't just a, a pop art or some stupid art like I don't know, Peter Max and all that psychedelic mm-hmm. shit. No, it's not that. Warhol's a, one of the greats, you know. Mm-hmm. He's, he said it, nobody else said it. Heim soup, <laughs> you know, he said that mm-hmm. to us, you know, and I thank him for it. Mm-hmm. Oh, Fellini's just, uh, uh, he's more like Dali, I suppose, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, he's just great. We just saw that. Great, a great <laughs> meal, you know, to go and have to see Fellini. He's had a great meal, a great meal of, be a f- senses. You know. We like Citizen Kane, don't we? And Citizen <laughs> Kane, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> that's something else too, you know, poor old Orson there, he's, mm, told, he's there for you. know, he goes on Dick Cabot and he's sort mm. of, please love me, you know, mm. I mean, I'm a big fat man now and I've eaten all this food and I did do well when I was younger and I can act, I can direct and you're all very kind to me, but at the moment I don't do anything. He <laughs> saw Citizen Kane about, I don't know, eight times from the end and the thing is, even after this primal and all that, you know, and you saw it, and he's, he's just saying it, you know, like the rosebud thing and all that. It's amazing. Do you see, you, do you see a time when you retire? Or no, I, not work. I couldn't, you know. He'll probably work until 80 or until, you know, he dies. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know. I can't foresee it, you know, because it, even like when, you, when you're a cripple, you carry on painting, you know, I mean. I mean, I would paint if I couldn't move, you know. I mean, it doesn't matter, you see. When I was saying about what Yoko did with Greenfield and took half an inch of rubbishy tape that we, that we none of us knew what we were doing cause at the time, it was just a bum tape. When I saw her create something, and saw how she created out of nothing, you don't have to be trained in rock and roll, the same as I didn't have to be trained singer. I can sing. I can, I, it's like you singing is singing till people here enjoy what you're singing, not being able to hold notes or anything like that. And... I don't have to do, create, I don't have to do it in rock and roll, you know, I mean, if, if I'm an old man, I can, uh, we, we'll make wallpaper together, you know, <laughs> it just uh, have the same, same depth and impact, the message is whatever, well, the medium, I don't understand, message, message the, the message medium, is the I medium, <laughs> you know. What's what happening with Mother Sanyoko? Well, she was doing all right before she met Elvis, you know, mm-hmm. and people tend, like when I was telling you that Howard Smith announced he was going to play her music, and all these idiots rang up and said, don't dare play it, she split the Beatles, she didn't split the Beatles, and even if she did, so what's that got to do with her fucking record? But she's a woman, and she's Japanese, there's racial prejudice against her, and there's female prejudice against her. It's as simple as that. People come up and shake my hand, they don't, I said, this is my wife. Well, that's why they don't like you. Yeah. Her work is far out, man. It, like, do they underst- has anybody understood uh, um, Warhol, or really, or understood his, his, uh, I, that building, you know, 24 hours of sleep and that? The Oko's Bottoms thing is his important, Bottoms film is as important as Sergeant Pepper. You know, it's, it's, it, it, to the real hip people, they know about it. There's a few people know. There's a person in Paris knows about her. There's a person in Moscow knows about her. There's a person in fucking China knows about her. But in general, she can't be accepted. Because she's so far out, man. It's hard to take. Her pain is such that she expresses herself in a way that hurts you. That you cannot take it. That's why they couldn't take Van Gogh and all that shit. It, it's too real. It hurts. That's why they kill you. Why, what, what account for the, your great popular... Because I fucking did it in... I copped out in that Beatle thing. I, I'm, I was like a, an artist that 
that uh, went off and like you know, have you never heard of Dylan Thomas and all them that never fucking wrote they just went off drinking and Brendan Bean and all them died of drink and we're all everybody that's done anything is like that I just found myself in a party I was I was an emperor you know and I had millions of chicks drugs drink fucking power and everybody's saying how great I was how could I get out of here just mm-hmm, you know it's just like being in a fucking coach I couldn't get out I couldn't create either but you know I created it could it came out but I was in the party man you don't get out of a thing like that it was like it was fantastic I've come out of the I came out the sticks I didn't hear about anything other no, Van Gogh was the most far out thing I'd ever heard of and even London was something we used to dream of, and London's nothing, you know. And uh, Paris and all this, it was all that, you know. I came out the fucking sticks into, into, to take over the fucking world, it seemed like to me. I couldn't, I, I was enjoying it, you know, and I was in it, and I was trapped in it too. I couldn't do anything about it. I was just going along for the ride. I was hooked, hooked, just like a junk. What do you think of America? I love it, you know, and I hate it. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's America is where it's at, it, man. You know, mm-hmm. I, should, I should have been born in New York, man. I should have <laughs> yes, been born in the village. That's where I belong. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah. why should? Why wasn't I born there? Like Paris was it in the 18th century or whatever it was. London, I don't think it's ever been it. It might have been it, literary wise, when Wilde and Evan Shaw and all them were there. New York was it. Mm-hmm. I regret it profoundly not being American <laughs> and not being born in Greenwich Village. That's where I should have been. But it never works that way, you know. Everybody heads towards the centre. That's why I'm here now. I'm here just to breathe it. It might be dying or there might be a lot of dirt in the air, but this is where it's happening. Mm. And you, you, li- you go to Europe to rest, you know, like in the country. But um, it's so, so overpowering America for me. And I'm such a fucking cripple mm. that I can't take much of it, you know. It's too much for me. I have to... But he's very New York, you know. I mean, he's I'm too so frightened of it. You know, it's so much, and uh, people are so aggressive. I can't take all that. You know, I have to. I mean, I I, I need to go home. You know, and I, I need to have to look at the grass. I'm always writing about English garden and that. No, I need that the trees and the grass. You know, mm. oh, don't I? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I need to go into the country. You know, because I can't stand too much. What is Liverpool? People. What was the influence on you? Liverpool was just where I was brought up, you know, they were like, like anywhere, you know, I love the I concept of it, but I don't live there. Some of the, cri- some of the cri- early Christians yeah. said, well, Oh, that's true, that's true, you know, because uh, it was a port, that means it was less hick than somewhere in the Midlands, like the Midwest or whatever you call it. We were a port, the second biggest port in, in England, also uh, between Manchester and Liverpool, that's where all the... the the north was where the money was made in the 1800s, whenever it was. That was where all the brass and the heavy people were. And that's where the, where the despised people were. We were the ones that were looked down upon by the southerners as animals, you know. Like the south, you or, or you easterners think that, that people are pigs down south here. And, you know, and the, and the people in New York think West Coast's hick and all that. So we were Hicksville. And also we're all a great amount of Irish descent and blacks and Chinamen and all sorts of... It was a real co- it's like San Francisco, you know. It's that, you know, that San Francisco is somewhere, something else. Why do you think hate Ashbury and all that happened there and didn't happen in L.A.? It happened in San Francisco, to where people are going. In L.A., you pass through and get a hamburger, you know. And Liverpool was like that, but there was nothing big. It wasn't American. It was going poor. It was a very poor city and tough. But people had a sense of humour because they're in so much pain, you know. So they're always cracking each other. They're very witty. And the, it's, it's the Irish place, you know. It's where the Irish came when they ran out of potatoes. And it's where black people were left or worked as slaves or whatever and, and created communities. It's cosmopolitan. And it's where the sailors would come home with the blues records from America on the ships. And the, they have... There's the biggest country in Western following in, in, in England in Liverpool, probably besides London, always besides London, because there's more of it there. But I remember... Uh, the first guitar I ever saw was a guy in a cowboy suit in the pr- province of Liverpool with the stars and the cowboy hat and a big dobro. You know, and, and they're all playing... They're, they're real cowboys, they take it seriously. They've been cowboys long before there was rock and roll. You know, it's a real... It, and there's folk clubs and there's all that was going on there. So there's all that kind of environment, you know. 
San Francisco, how did you, how did you, how did you when, when Sergeant, at that time, when Sergeant Cook was at the time, San Francisco was coming off and that, what did you think of San Francisco? I thought, well, and, you know, I was, George went over in the end. I was all for going there and living on the hate, you know. I mean, in my head, I thought, well, hell, the acid's it, and this is the answer, let's go. I'll go there, you know, and mm. I was going to go there, but I'm too nervous to do anything, actually, you know. Uh, I thought, hate, uh, I'll go there, and, and we'll live like that, you know, and I'll make music and all that, but of course it didn't come true, you know. But it happened in San Francisco, I mean, it, it happened all right, didn't it? I mean, <laughs> it goes down in history. Mm. I love it. You know, it's like when Shaw was in England and, and they all went to Paris and there's all that in New York, San Francisco and London. Even London, we created something there mm. with Mick and us and all of it. We didn't know what we were doing, but we were all talking and blabbing over coffee like they must have done in Paris over the... over the... P talking about painting. We, in Burden and, and Brian Jones, would be up night and day talking about music and playing records and blabbing and arguing and getting drunk and... You know, just just all that. You know, it's beautiful history, and it happened in all these different places. You know, mm. I just miss New York. <laughs> <laughs> but in New York, they had their own cool clique. You know, and she came mm. out of that. Oh, it's a tough scene in New York, isn't it? One of the. Uh, I've got to do it. It comes. There's a great place to come and spend money. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, but it. Yes. This is the first time I'm really seeing it, you see, because I was always too nervous, always a famous Beatle. Uh, Dylan showed it me, you know, once on a sort of guided tour around the village and everything, but I never got any feel of it. I just knew Dylan was New York, and I always sort of wished I'd been there for the experience that 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 Bob got, you know, from, from living around. What's the nature of your relationship? Well, it's sort of... Uh, acquaintance you know because we're so nervous whenever we used to meet it was always on the most nerve-wracking circumstances and i know i was always uptight and i know bobby was and people like al aronowitz would try and bring us together and we were together and we'd spend some time but i'd always be too paranoid or or i'd, I'd be aggressive or something and vice versa we didn't really speak but we spent some a lot of time together and he came to my house which was Kenwood, can you imagine it? I didn't know where to put me <laughs> in this sort of so this bourgeois home life I was living in. I didn't know what to do and things like that. It was all strange. I, I used to go to his hotel rather, and I loved him, you know, because he wrote some beautiful stuff. I used to love that, you know, his so-called protest things, you know. But I liked the sound of him. I didn't have to listen to his words. He used to come with his acetate and say, listen to this, you know. And he said, did you hear the words? And I said, no, it doesn't matter, you know, just the sound is what counts, you know. The overall thing, you know, you don't have to hear what Bob Dylan's saying, you just have to hear the way he says it. Like, medium is the measure, or whatever mix-up, but Dylan was like that, you know. But I had but quite a good him I respected lot, you know. him, I respected him I a lot, you know. I know Paul didn't, explained. I think Paul was jealous, you know, Paul didn't like any, any other artist, you know. But I, that's valid. Paul didn't get hyped like me. I, I had too many father figures, you know. And you like words. That's I like words, like too, so I liked a lot of the stuff he did. I like words. Do you, do you, do you see him as uh, the great... No, no, I see him as a, as a, as a, another poet, you know, or, a, or as a... a, a poet, a poet, yes. Competition, I mean, you, you know, just read my books, which are written before I'd heard of Dylan or read Dylan or even heard of anybody. It's the same, you know. I, I didn't wasn't I didn't come after Elvis and Dylan. I've been around always, mm. but if I see or meet a great artist, I love them. You know, I just love them. I go fanatical around them. You know, for a mm. short period, mm -hmm. and then I get over it. You know, and if they wear green socks, I'm liable to wear green socks for a period too. You know, but uh, that's all. When was the last time you saw that? He came to our house with yeah. George. And when I'd written Cold Turkey, and, and we were, wife. and his wife, yeah, and we we were just, I was just trying to get him to record, he'd get put him on piano for Cold Turkey to make a a, a rough take, but his wife was f pregnant or something, and you she know, she didn't, and she they left, you know, but he's calmed down a lot now, you know, than what he was. We, I just remember we were both in chase and both on fucking junk, mm -hmm. and all these freaks on us and Ginsberg and all those people. You know. I was nervous to see in London when he came, you know. You were in that movie with him? I don't know what, oh yeah, yeah, I've never seen it, I'm in it, you know, and it's frightened as hell, you know. 
I haven't seen it, I've, but somebody did. Is that really? Yeah. I don't want to run it because it's too old. I'd love to see it. I have to see it. That I must How ask to see it. it? Could, could mm-hmm. you arrange it? Oh, great. I never did see Probably it. You know. I was so City. frightened, you know. Yes. And Bob said, I want, like, I it's, like, it's like you it. saying to Jan, or, but you never know what double on top. I was always so paranoid that he said, I want you to be in this film. He just wanted me to be in the film. I thought, why? What? He's going to put me down. It's going to be, yeah. you know, and I went all through this terrible thing. So in the film, I'm just blabbing off like, just sort of, mm. oh, I, I'm commenting all the time like you do when you're very mm. high and stone. Yeah. I don't, what did he say? Uh, I don't remember the exact thing, but uh, you come off really nervous. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to I'm, it. I've been up all night. We're trying to trade yeah. humor. That's it. We've, we've been well, smart, Alex. Like, like, like Alan, and, uh, well, like Alan and, and that guy at the... Um, oh, it's terrible. But it was his scene, you know. Mm. That was the problem for me. It was his movie, and I, I didn't... You know... Oh, let's see it. I was on well, his territory. That. That's why I was so nervous, you know. It was under... I was on his session... Tomorrow night? No, oh, Yoko, we've got... To, you're going to see the Toronto Rock film tomorrow. You're going to make oh, a okay, film okay. tomorrow. And you're going to do an interview tomorrow. And you're probably lined up Howard Smith for tomorrow by the sound of what you were on the bloody phone. This is the woman who drove me mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's very No, for you. yeah. OK, so yes, try and call it. We'll see it some other day. Mm. But if you can just tell us how to get in touch with it, mm. that would be interesting. It's Penny Baker. Oh, yeah, I see. I get mixed up with him and the maid. Penny Baker, Toronto. Right. Oh, I see. OK, well, we'll probably see him tomorrow. I don't know how we're going to see it and make a movie. Oh, sure, it's very easy. Is it? Mm-hmm. Not for you. No, I mean, it's such a full day. Mm-hmm. You know. Here now is Rolling Stone editor and publisher Jan S. Werner. After the interview was done, about a week later, I called him up. We had a few spots. I needed to fill in some information. And then just kind of a casual conversation. And I asked him, uh, I said, you're going back to London. What's a rough picture of your immediate future, say, the next three months? And John said, well, I'd just like to vanish a bit. It wore me out, New York. I love it. I'm sort of just fascinated by it, like a fucking monster. Doing the films was a nice way of meeting a lot of people. I think we've both said and done enough for a few months, especially with this article. I'd like to get out of the way and wait till they all... I said, well, do you have a rough picture of the next few years? And John responds, oh, no, I couldn't think of the next few years. It's abysmal thinking of how many years there are to go. Millions of them. I just play it by the week. I don't think much ahead of a week. And then I say, I have no more to ask. And he goes, well, fancy that. I said, do you have anything to add? And he goes, no, I can't think of anything positive and heartwarming to win your readers over. And then I was saying this, and I said, do you have a picture of when I'm 64. He goes, no, no. I hope we're a nice old couple living off the coast of Ireland or something like that looking at our scrapbook of madness. How brilliant. 